Okay, and I would just ask if you are from the public and you know that you're going to be raising your hand to participate later, we'll, we, we will need you to change your username to your first and last name. We'll need a full name and not um, an email address or a phone number. Um, I see a lot of those coming in. So I will repeat that message too, but wanted to give you a head start. Thank you, Jim. And Allison, did you want to caution people about the recording? Oh, sure. We'll do that now, too. Okay. Um, so if you are a board member or a staff member presenting tonight, make sure when you're turning your camera on and off that it's your video camera in your little box and not the recording. <laughs> so unfortunately, we all have access to stop and start the recording of this meeting. So we don't want to accidentally do that. So um, just make sure when you're turning your camera on or off that you're not hitting the recording button, which is probably at the very top of your screen. You can see we're recording now with that little red button. And Allison, I have an indication from Dan that he can't unmute. Oh, that's why he was pointing to his ears. <laughs> there we go. There, there we go. I think oh, when I you came you off and on, you weren't a co-host. <laughs> I should have been pointing to my mouth, right, Karen? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we thought you were still eating dinner. <laughs> Okay, Allison, do you think we're ready? Yep, we can start. Okay, I'm calling to order the Open Space Board of Trustees meeting of October 14, 2020. Uh, welcome to all who are watching or listening in and participating uh, in the comment periods. We appreciate, uh, as always, your patience and your willingness to uh, continue to track what we're doing and provide input uh, during the COVID pandemic and using these systems that I think we're getting better and better at, but still can be a little bit challenging. So anyway, thank you for your participation and your patience. As we always do, I will start with a roll call so that people who are listening will also know which board members are here. Uh, Hal Halstein. I'm present, Kurt. Karen Holwick. Here. Dave Kuntz. Here. Caroline Miller. Here. And I'm Kurt Brown. And so Leah, we have a full uh, quorum of board members tonight. <clears throat> uh, I'm gonna start with a quick overview of the agenda, particularly relating to the opportunities for public comment. <clears throat> we have two opportunities for public comment tonight. Uh, the first will be an opportunity for general comments um, this will follow directly after the approval of the minutes and will be for any topic that people want to discuss not related to Wonderland Lake. The second uh, period for public comment will be specifically on the proposed Wonderland Lake ISP actions and the possible name change and we'll follow the staff presentation on those topics. Does the board have any questions or comments about the agenda before we go into the uh, rules for the meeting? Okay, good. Well, um, as you folks know, I can see you all, so you can always just raise your hand and, uh, and we'll have you chime in. Okay, at this point, I'll ask Allison Eklund, our uh, open space uh, staff person who is handling the Zoom process and also the public sign-up process to go over for us the meeting rules um, and the process for signing up. Allison. Thanks, Kurt. Let me get those slides up. We did have a chat already that the um, window had closed to sign up to speak in advance, but we'll still ask for a raise of hands and I'll explain how to do that and how to do that if you've called in by phone for <laughs> both the open public comment section and the Wonderland Lake comment section. So you're not too late. That's 
that will still be offered in a little bit. Let me um, share these slides first. So we'll go over, because this is a different type of meeting and we're doing it all online, we do have some specific guidelines for that. So this meeting has been called to conduct the business of the city of Boulder. So activities that disrupt, delay, or otherwise interfere with the meeting are prohibited. <clears throat> the time for speaking or asking questions may be limited and we'll, Kurt will determine what that time is uh, and let us know in a little bit here. Each person uh, shall, oh, so you, if you raise your hand and you wanna participate, you will need to provide a full name, a first and last name. You can't have um, whatever your device is labeled. For example, Tom's iPad, we won't unmute you for that. So if you have called in and you would like to participate, I can rename your phone number and you can text me your name at 720-576-8593 and I will rename you. So. Uh, a phone number won't work. We'll need a full name. Um, no video will be permitted except by the board members and staff presenting. So anyone participating will be by voice only. Uh, Kurt shall enforce these rules by muting anyone who violates any of the rules. And the chat function is enabled. So you will be able to ask technical questions uh, to me. and me or Leo will do our best to get back to you. But again, those are technical questions only. So if an attendee att attempts to use the chat for any other reason, we might have to disable that function tonight. And only the host and individuals designated by the host will be permitted to share their screens during this meeting. So let me go over a few more things um, for the people wishing to participate tonight. If you want, when we get to either the public comment section or the Wonder, Wonderland Lake public hearing section, if you want to participate, you can raise your hand and that is by, um, if you scroll down to the participant box at the bottom of your screen, you will, and, and click on that to open it, there'll be an option at the bottom of that box to raise your hand feature. I will go in order of raised hands to call on you. And then um, if you have joined by phone, you can press star nine to raise your hand. And then when it's uh, your turn to be unmuted, you would press star six to unmute yourself when it's your time to speak. So if you have raised your hand during public comment, I will recognize you in the order that the hands were raised or anyone who has signed up in advance to speak and um, Kurt will let us know what the time is. Leah will present or will show her screen with the timer running. After I have un unmuted you, please say and spell your first and last name and then the timer will start once your comments begin. So I will let you know who's up and that you're unmuted and then who's on deck. So you can be ready and I'll un unmute you when it's your turn. I think I covered all of that. <laughs> thank you, Allison, and jump back in at any time if you need to. Yeah, um, thanks. We, we recognize that people may be coming in and still trying to get in, and you may need to go over those again, and that's just fine. So uh, thanks to you for doing all the hard work here and making it a lot easier for us. Okay, we will move then to the approval of the minutes. Um, and these would be the board minutes from our meeting dated September 9, 2020. Uh, does anybody have any proposed changes to anything on the first page? You can just raise your hand. Karen. Um, at the very bottom of the first page of the minutes, um, I would like to suggest adding uh, asked what staff is doing to increase diversity within the Junior Ranger program, and then add and specifically involve more Spanish speakers living in Boulder. Is, is that a continuation of the sentence, Karen, the way you're laying it out? It's just an additional phrase, yep. Yeah, okay. So, and then continue with and cost for the overall project. 
Okay, so you're proposing to insert right after Junior Ranger program a couple additional clauses. And would you read them again? And specifically involve more Spanish speakers living in Boulder, comma. Uh, I, th I thought, okay, yep. I thought you had two. <laughs> no, then the final phrase is already there and the cost of the over for the overall project. Okay, any objection to uh, Karen's addition there? Raise your hand. Otherwise, I assume that will be okay. Uh, and will anybody else uh, change on the first page? And one other just question, the paragraph right above that, the second paragraph from the bottom, um, says that we'll be getting the Ag uh, Land Use Assignment Guidelines at the November 18th meeting, and that got dropped from the calendar. I wanted to know if that was intentionally or just an... Uh, I'll, I'll be updating the board on that uh, uh, during matters from the department. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Anything else on page one? Okay, let's go to page two. Any changes or amendments? Dave? Yeah, uh, I'd like to suggest that, uh, Leah, we delete the, the last sentence under the, paragraph, the last paragraph. Dave Koontz gave an update on the Greenways Advisory Committee and replace that. I'd like it to uh, read a little more specifically. So the, this is the suggested language. The Greenways Advisory Committee recommended to Council acceptance of the 2021 to 2026 Greenways CIP budget highlighting the update of the Greenways Master Plan starting in 2021. Good. Did you get that, Leah? <laughs> That's pretty good. Dave, I'm going to have you say that once more. I, I'm not sure I can. <laughs> this is a hey, test Leah, you, you can see if I actually uh, said what I said before. <laughs> The Greenways Advisory Committee recommended to Council the 2021 to 2026 Greenways CIP budget, highlighting the update of the Greenways Master Plan starting in 2021. Any questions for Dave or concerns about that? Anything else on page two? I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes as amended. I so move. Second. I'll second it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to do a roll call then uh, about approval of the minutes for September 9th. Hal. Approve. Karen. Yes. Dave. Yes. Caroline. Yes. And I vote yes. So we are unanimous on that, Leah. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Okay, so now we're gonna to go to public comment for items not identified for public hearing. And I will just say a word before we start. Um, we've gotten notification from the city manager to all the boards, including the city council, to please be uh, attentive to ensuring that all of our public meetings uh, where there's public participation uh, that we follow the rules of civil discourse. Uh, there have been some very challenging issues in front of council and maybe several of the other boards the last few months. And uh, I think members of council, a city manager have noticed that uh, there's been a lapse from using uh, civil discourse in several of those instances and wants us to make sure that we um, remind people. And I think for this board, for our board, we've gotten a great deal of public testimony and almost without exception, uh, the public has been extremely uh, courteous about how they've shared things, even when they were very serious issues and about which they felt strongly. And we just want to continue that tradition here. So I just want to pass that along before we start. Uh, Allison, how many total people do we have attending the meeting, would you guess? Well, 35, but that's with staff. And, okay. Yeah. So, so maybe 20, 25, roughly. Or less. Okay. And so how many folks you have signed up for 
uh, general comment right now. It looks like we have one signed up in advance and then four more have raised their hands now. So I'm assuming they all want the general comment. Okay, well, we can check as we go. Uh, yeah. Well, I will then say we'll do three minutes for each uh, okay. commenter, if you would. Sounds good. So we'll start with Raymond Bridge. I will unmute you now. And then Lynn Siegel. Ooh. I lost that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Lynn Siegel will be up. Okay, Ray. I'm not seeing the timer. Okay. Great. Good evening, trustees. I'm Raymond Bridge, 435 South 38th Street in Boulder. And I'd like to speak briefly on the proposed El Dorado Canyon to Walker Ranch Trail. As you know, the most recent document on this effort was the so-called feasibility study. Somebody is, <laughs> okay. As you know, the most recent document on this effort was the so-called feasibility study of November, 2018. That document contained a conceptual trail alignment that would cut dozens of switchbacks through the Mount Western Mountain Parks Habitat Conservation Area, which I contend would have major deleterious environmental impact. No analysis of potential ecological impact was included and none has been done since. Unfortunately, we did not take advantage of the delay to do such a study. In mid 2019, CPW initiated a delay of consideration of this trail while it developed a visitor use master plan for El Dorado Springs State Park. I have been informed by a senior planner at CPW that a draft of the uh, VUMP has been completed and that it will be presented at the November meeting of the Wildlife Commission, which is scheduled for November 19th to 20th. Hence, you can expect that there will be lots of pressure to move forward on this issue. I hope that you will not give consideration to any route going through the Western Mountain Parks HCA until a thorough ecological impact study has been done. And since no effort has been made to conduct one during the CPW initiated display, I would contend that you should not permit any shortcuts because of time pressure. Remember that HCAs are established to protect our most valuable and sensitive resources. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Up next, we have Lynn Siegel. We also have a Marky here. If Marky can change uh, how that name appears to a first and last name, we'll need you to do that before we can unmute you. Uh, but for now, I'll, I am unmuting Lynn. I'd like to see how this habitat on the South Boulder. And Lynn, would you just start by stating your name and oh, address Lynn or Siegel. city? Lynn Siegel, 538 Dewey, Boulder. Thank I'd you. like to see how the, um, the habitat on the South Boulder floodplain and CU South is actually being affected by the alluvium and any changes with the upstream detention program that's proposed and um, and with any past um, proposals that have happened and the differences and have it kind of clearly spelled out like visually works really well for me but then I'm an ultrasonographer so I tend to be visual <laughs> and but I think it works for a lot of people um, because I, it, it's unclear in my mind um, what is going on with the a potential land swap or or disposal of open space other land and how what how the alluvium is going to affect those creatures and those uh, plants that are in that area um, it's just not clear to me 
Um, and I think it's kind of important. My sense is that alternative six, that keeping the stream in the stream, not having any unnatural um, detention um, ponds or, or um, dams is, is the best option in spite of the fact that it might affect some of the habitat or some of the, um, the plants in the area um, because it's, it, it, the, the, the approach of having a dam is going to be more significant on those resources than, than a natural alluvium. And I'd like to see how visually um, from the Open Space Board of Trustees um, because this seems to be a big issue with CU South and their proposal for the campus and along with everything else that's going into it, the transportation and the other aspects of it, but it's unclear to me about the open space, um, the resource of the um, plants and animals in, in, the, um, in the pathway of whatever gets done in that area. So. I just appreciate being able to see that better. And um, so far as um, spending a lot of time talking at the beginning of these meetings, I find it rather intimidating that, um, that this, this never happened live. And now just because we're virtual, this, we have to have this intimidating statements made that we're here for the purpose of good things and you can't say anything bad. And that's kind of understood with city meetings and I just find it rather intimidating. Thanks, bye. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Okay, we have Margaret. I'm so sorry. I'm going to LeCompte. put your, your last name. LeCompte. And I am unmuting you now. And then next up we'll have Jim McMillan. Am I, am, am I unmuted now, Allison? Yes. Okay. We can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and thank you for fixing my name. Um, I wanted to give, um, well, I'm Margaret LeCompte, and uh, my nickname is Marky, and I live at 290 Pawnee Drive in Boulder. I'm, I'm here to, first of all, give a big thank you and a shout out to the Open Space Board of Trustees for spending so much time to ensure the protection of our open space and to the, in the following the mission of the open space uh, and mountain parks um, agency. Uh, in particular, uh, I, I, I'm want to thank you for protecting our open space from being treated like a piggy bank of land that is sort of expendable or tradable out whenever there is an emergency or needed. This open space is irretrievable and once it's gone, it's gone forever. So I am extremely grateful to the Open Space Board of Trustees for being so scrupulous about protecting it. I also want to acknowledge how much hard work the city, the Open Space Board of Trustees has done in getting the city staff to finally consider seriously upstream flood mitigation strategies that might well probably protect open space and endangered species far better than the current flood mitigation projects that are being considered. I'm also um, happy that the Open Space Board of Trustees is pushing the city staff to reveal what the permitting requirements are for the, from the many local, state, and federal agencies for the extensive flood mitigation mm -hmm infrastructure that's now being considered uh, by the city utilities department. These could pose insurmountable obstacles to flood mitigation that would impede any kind of protection for downstream citizens. We would, it would be very well to know about these now so that necessary plans could be made to accommodate to them before the city accepts a plan that cannot be implemented. Thanks very much. Thanks, Marky. Okay. Jim, I am going to unmute you. And then last, we'll have Robert Sharp. 
All right. Uh, my name is Jim McMillan. Just verifying that you can hear me. Yep. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. I live at uh, 1277 Aikens Way in Boulder. <clears throat> and uh, I want to support the comments of the previous speakers, Lynn and Mark. Um, and, and I'll bring in <clears throat> uh, a little bit more um, emphasis on what I, I consider, I'm, I'm really speaking to the flood mitigation uh, design and the fact that currently it's being green lighted on a hundred year flood mitigation, a hundred year flood mitigating that. And I think in, in light of climate change, that is just pure folly. It's, it's a Band-Aid for a broken arm or something like that. It's insufficient. And <clears throat> we're, we're likely, very likely to have much bigger storms than that. And so do, risking all this damage of the state protected area and this, this, ecos, this precious ecosystem habitat that is irreplaceable, as Mark, you mentioned, um, it's being put at risk by an inadequate flood design that will require further efforts later to correct the deficiencies if it goes forward based on 100 year. It should be 500 year. And so um, I, I, <clears throat> I, I would like the Open Space Board of Trustees to consider the fact that what is being planned and offered is insufficient and likely to require re rework. Uh, the second issue is the jeopardy that this, this high hazard construction, a flood wall and so forth going down to bedrock um, would have on the viability of the wet meadow habitat with its rather unique hydrology. Um, and I wanted to um, encourage the Open Space Board of Trustees to really examine and drill in, drill in on what is being done in terms of due diligence to verify that the engineered water conveyance that's, that's been theorized um, and discussed is being able to allow the groundwater flows to continue <clears throat> even in the presence of a large flood wall, um, that they'll actually work. And as we've heard pr in previous OSBT uh, meetings, you know, these types of habitats, once they're messed around with, they're not able to be restored, or at least we haven't figured out how to do that yet. It's, it's really Mother Nature's finest creations uh, that these things work and are so robust and stable. And it's something to be treasured. It's, it's a beautiful gateway to, to Boulder uh, coming in from Denver, and we're jeopardizing uh, the long-term viability of it with this construction project and open space board of trustees is is really the last man standing uh, in terms of having some integrity to really make sure that what we're doing will be effective so i want to thank you for your efforts to date and uh, continue to be vigilant uh, in looking out for the viability of the boulder valley eco shed thank you very much for your time and attention thank you jim Okay, and then our last speaker for the general public comment is Robert Sharp. And Robert, I'm unmuting you now. I'm oh, there, okay. Ready? Yep. Okay, I'm Robert Sharp, 5995 Marshall Drive, Boulder. Um, thank you for listening, and uh, thank you for the work that you do. Um, I, Gilbert White, the most famous uh, flood ex world-class expert, longtime resident of Boulder, adamantly said toward the end of his career, forget about 100-year floodplain planning. 500 is what is needed, and that might not be adequate, but go for 500. I'm here to talk about Marshall Mesa, though. And I'm here to ask you for uh, to consider a pause, a few months at least, in the uh, trail work being done, yet to be done on Marshall Mesa. Um, uh, mesas, as you know, are are extremely rare and unique in the county. Only four or five of them. Each one of them is very different. Each each side and face very different and very unique. Interesting. Um, I, 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 I wonder if we can reaffirm some of the basic values of, of people and of open space and, and grapple a little with the, the, some of the vast difference. Uh, a lot of people 
um, compare nature to the face and body of a human being, a, a loved one, it's that precious, or for a work of art, you know, and we, we have land, we have famous landscape art in the best museums in the world. Um, and, and then there's the ecosystem, you know, all of the rich uh, variety of life of every kind in the soil itself, and the, the historic landscape, the historic features or uses that have been there, such a, such a rich tapestry. And uh, um, I, I have had a particular love for Marshall Mesa, having known it from, you know, for over 60 years and seeing it daily for over 30. And years ago, a trail was suddenly cut across the mesa from the middle to the east to 68th Street. And it was a, a horrific event for me. And uh, of course, it was for recreation. And recreation continues to push over other, other values. When that trail was finally done, the open space, uh, uh, some board members and staff promised me in particular that that was it no more trails no more of that kind of stuff on marshall mesa yet suddenly a few weeks ago a 2000 foot swath was cut across the mesa to replace the historic route which had been neglected uh you know to the point of, of danger and uh and now that's to be restored but the restoration plan is not that it's a uh, it's foreign material. It's not, not a restoration job. I'd like to be involved. I'd like to have a pause for some consultation about this. I feel like my uh, loved one has been slashed and beaten in front of my face um, and is left to, the body is left for me to look at every day here. It's that, it's that kind of feeling that some of us have for the value of, of, of these places. And I'm really- uh, asking, Robert, thank, thank you. Please, give a chance to do something better over there. Thank you. Thank you for your thoughts. <clears throat> That's all we have, Kurt. Okay, thanks for managing that, Allison. Um, <clears throat> Dan, I think it then comes to you for uh, the Wonderland Lake issues. Yeah, thank you, Kurt. Uh, and this will be a public hearing. So if, if some of the folks didn't get called during general, it's because you likely signed up for public comment on this particular public hearing issue, which we'll dive into now. And so as most of you know, this uh, two year um, effort is, is winding down and culminating uh, before you tonight with a, uh, a preferred package of actions for the Wonderland Lake area. Uh, that staff is providing you as uh, as well as an additional issue that came about a year or so ago and that was uh, a request from uh, to the city manager from the community on a proposed name change for Wonderland Lake which will also be a topic of tonight's conversation and so with that I would like to introduce uh, Open Space Mountain Parks senior planner Casey French who will provide you with a presentation. And then I believe after the presentation, we'll go into the public hearing and then board deliberation. Hey, thanks, Dan. I'm gonna pull up my presentation here. So bear with me for just one second. And can you see the presentation? Yes. Yes, great. Thank you. So thanks, Dan, Casey, French. Um, and I'm here to present to you tonight on the Wonderland Lake Integrated Site Project. Uh, tonight's purpose is to conclude the engagement process with the community and nearby residents. I'll describe the resulting preferred package of actions and request a board recommendation to proceed into work planning and implementation and request the board also make a recommendation to the city manager regarding the name change proposal. Just a quick reminder on the purpose of the ISP process. 
Uh, with this ISP, we are starting from the OSBT and council approved guidance in the North TSA. And the ISP focuses on coordinating the multiple implementation efforts, such as trails, interpretive, restoration, and trailhead and access types of projects, and planning for those projects at a finer scale. Uh, the idea is to holistically plan for an area and to have as much as possible alignment across the community about the on the ground actions before an, er before an area before proceeding to the implementation or the construction phase. So the engagement for this project began in the fall of 2018, uh, but due to community concerns, it was paused and a new process was developed. Um, there were three community engagement windows in the redesign process, and all of which have influenced and shaped the preferred package of actions that we will be presenting this evening. So in June 2019, staff restarted the community engagement with the first engagement window by setting the context and I'm asking the community to share ideas for on the ground actions related to meeting the goals of the area. And approximately 108 community members attended the meetings and an additional 162 community members completed the online exercise and, and a total of approximately 1500 comments or ideas were shared. Staff sorted the ideas shared and we developed a matrix of options. Um, this took the form of a questionnaire where community members reviewed the ideas or actions and indicated which ones they supported or not. Um, 728 community members participated in engagement window number two last December. So from engagement number window, window number two, we heard support for more limited improvements that are better fit with the character of Wonderland Lake. Um, this included support for actions related to shoreline and habitat restoration, conservation and protections, lake health, repairing trails, improved fishing delineation and access, and limited trail amenities, trailhead amenities, such as bike racks, public restrooms, and a water fountain. We also heard that for many, existing conditions were adequate and there was not support for actions related to additional trail side structures, such as bird blinds, picnic tables, benches, or other trail modifications, uh, major improvements focused on accessibility or other additional amenities or uses near the Foothills Nature Center. We incorporated this feedback into the preliminary package of actions, which, which had significantly less change than the previous 2018 concepts. Um, it had minimal infrastructure and with much remaining the same or similar to current conditions. Uh, the actions were focused on providing visitor amenities with community support, those that provide equitable access and support interests across the community, and those that meet OSMP's operational needs. Um, and just as a reminder, the pier and the boardwalk, uh, they were previously moved from, removed from consideration as well as waiting, which had since been determined to be infeasible. Uh, the waiting decision was made in light of the possibility of harmful algae blooms at lakes and ponds across uh, the city and Colorado, including Wonderland Lake. So we presented the preliminary package of actions to the community in engagement window number three in an online video presentation this summer. Uh, community members were invited to participate in a questionnaire aimed at gauging the level of support for the proposed actions and 320 community members participated. The majority of engaged community members indicated a level of support for the actions proposed with support and somewhat support between 81% and 64% for the various actions. Uh, based on this community input, staff affirmed most of the actions in the preliminary package of actions as desirable and made mo minor modifications focusing on addressing community comments and concerns. And I'll go over the preferred package of actions and how it was modified in the upcoming slides. So the preferred package of actions has been organized into the six themes that we've used throughout this process shown here. I will start with uh, wetland and shoreline habitat and wildlife conservation and protection on the northwest and south sides of the lake. As a reminder, uh, the actions were sorted into operational needs and ISP actions for community input during engagement window number three, as shown here. Uh, no modifications uh, were made or suggested in response to engagement window number three with 81% of the participants supporting the action. The, Operational ISP actions include enacting a regulatory closure to the no public access area with complementary fencing and limited signs. 
uh, prohibiting boats and belly boats and relocating the existing southwest access point or adding a vehicle turnaround spot. Uh, the proposed action which for which we sought additional community input was to add down trees or logs to the lake to add more structure and improve fish and amphibian habitat. Um, a reminder, the no public access area is the hatched area around the lake. A regulatory closure will be enacted and supported by filling in the fencing gaps and adding limited signs. Um, operationally and, and specifically for enforcement reasons, um, it's really necessary for formal regulatory closures to be clearly, clearly marked. Um, ISP action number 17, which is to add interpretive signs with messaging about the value of wetlands and shoreline habitat to convey the ecological values of the shoreline, is also meant to complement this ISP action, and I'll speak to that a little bit later on again in, in this presentation. So currently the trucks that are needed to service the existing southwest access point um, ha don't have a great place to turn around and wetlands could potentially be damaged. So in order to eliminate the need to drive along the trail and turn around near wetlands, we are investigating relocating the access point further south. Um, and this proposed new location is on parks and recreations land. So more coordination and agreement um, is necessary. So if that is determined not to be possible, um, then we would um, add a vehicle turnaround spot to better delineate where service vehicles should turn around to avoid damaging wetlands. So prohibiting uh, belly boats protects the lake and sensitive shoreline and in light of the possibility of harmful algae blooms, uh, water access is infeasible. Uh, adding structure to the lake such as down logs will not have any visual impact to the area, but it can improve aquatic habitat at no to a, a very low cost. Moving on to access to the area. Uh, the ISP actions related to this theme are all operational and include continued coordination with the city's transportation department to create a safe and visible crosswalk um, and designating two additional access points. Uh, we've begun our coordination with the transportation department uh, and this action involves assessing the site relative to transportation standards, which informs the preferred treatment method. Um, and the two access points are already acting as such with community members using them to enter the area um, and with existing access point infrastructure. Uh, OSMP does have an operational need to formalize these access points and to designate them so that they in, their, in our department's asset inventory and maintained properly. Moving on to trail and trail site improvements. Uh, the only ISP action is operational and is to bring trails up to accessible standards as feasible. Uh, bringing trails up to accessible standards will improve the current condition of the trail and fix the muddy and rutted sections. It will improve trail sustainability and support current and anticipated future use with minimal maintenance. Um, bringing trails up to accessible standards includes reducing grades in steeper locations, uh, improving the surface of the trails with uh, crushed rock materials like, like crusher fines, uh, and maintaining an established width. The most challenging section of trail um, is just at the northeast juncture. This section of trail is challenging, challenging due to the steep grades and the interconnectedness uh, with the dam spillway infrastructure. Uh, the design solutions uh, must be compatible with dam safety requirements and those will be explored during the implementation phase and include grading and rerouting and getting as close as possible to meeting standards. And while standards may not be able to be met in this area, it will be made more accessible and without major trail infrastructure. This action of bringing trails up to accessible standards as feasible is also one of the primary ways we are meeting the educational goals. Uh, OSMP has a long history of leading accessible oriented heights, hikes in this area, and by bringing the trails up to accessibility standards as feasible is needed for OSMP to continue to offer this programming. Uh, much of the trail system already meets or closely meets this standard. And in addition, uh, Wonderland Lake provides a really unique opportunity for accessibility when looking across the system. Moving on to access to conservation of and activities on the east side of Wonderland Lake along the dam and peninsula. The operational ISP actions include updating the regulatory signs and to extend fencing to prevent people from cutting across the spillway. The other actions for which we saw additional feedback on include uh, the fishing access points from the trail down to the water's edge along the dam, 
uh, restoring peninsula habitat and, and restoring the shoreline along the peninsula. There are also two actions related to activities and they are to allow ice skating and to continue to prohibit uh, sledding. Uh, the yellow ribbon here notes um, an action with the community feedback that we wanted to address. Um, in response to listening to the overall sentiment, the less is more, the number of fishing access paths have been reduced from two to three to one to two. Um, this action had 77% support and 23% of participants who did not support it. Uh, this ISP operational action recommends fencing in the highlighted area to discourage public access across the spillway. Uh, there's a desire to keep people away from and off of dam infrastructure. Uh, the peninsula habitat restoration areas shown here um, would be supported with fencing. Um, restoration area one is for the most part existing uh, with the existing fencing and current uh, restoration successes as far as reduction of social tra trails and areas denuded of vegetation. Um, there are a few places where fencing could be filled in, especially as it integrates with any future shoreline work. But the intent here in this restoration area number one is to continue building off of the current success, and it's mostly just maintaining ex uh, current ex conditions. Uh, restoration area number two um, has areas that are currently denuded of vegetation, and this represents better opportunities for vegetation enhancements or restoration in the ISP. Um, this area is currently not fenced, and this portion of the ISP action consists of adding the fencing um, and seeding for native grasses and forbs with a focus on pollinator habitat. The shoreline restoration is focused on managing erosion into the lake, improving habitat, and providing a waterfront visitor experience that discourages wading. The shoreline uh, vegetation restoration areas are shown here with uh, cross hatching and are supported with fencing. And then the shoreline stabilization or water viewing areas are interspersed between the revegetated areas. Uh, the shoreline stabilization areas or water viewing areas are located in the area that currently reminds one of a beach with a gently sloping sandy shore. Uh, the proposal is to explore regrading and using rocks to create a steeper and rockier shoreline. Uh, this concept recognizes the enjoyable experience of standing at the water's edge, so as, as much as possible will retain that proximity to water and waterfront experience. It also provides an accessible fishing opportunity and will have a, have a natural and rugged feel while discouraging wading. Um, the shoreline restoration as a whole with the interspersed vegetation, as I said, is aimed at um, minimizing erosion and improving aquatic and lake health while providing an enjoyable visitor experience. Uh, the next ISP action is to construct one to two fishing access paths consisting of rocky steps from the Wonderland Lake Trail down to the water's edge along the dam. Uh, fishing would still be available along the whole dam, but this improves accessibility, better defines fishing access areas, and, and generally concentrate access to primary paths, but with, with minimal development. And while the North TSA recommends an area along the dam for sledding, um, upon further investigation, a safe location could not be identified. So uh, sledding will continue to be allowed at Chautauqua. And it was a recently approved at Gun Barrel through that ISP process. Um, and other locations um, in the system may be identified in uh, future planning efforts. Uh, in regards to ice skating, uh, the goal in the North TSA is to create consistent visitor regulations and increase safety. And again, after a further investigation into citywide practice and policy on ice skating on other lakes in the city, um, allowing ice skating at visitors' own risk with specific warning signs uh, is more consistent. And so given the types of activities which are allowed only under certain specific conditions and the safety concerns with harmful algae blooms, and along with the current confusion about where some activities are currently allowed, um, there's just an operational need for the department to update the outdated regulatory signs uh, to make it uh, clear to visitors what is allowed where and not. Moving on to educational experiences and interpretive signs. Uh, the proposed actions are adding interpretive signs with messaging about the value of wetlands and shoreline habitat and adding temporary educational signs on the peninsula about and during the restoration. Um, ISP action number 17 
uh, which is adding the interpretive signs with the messaging about the value of wetlands and shoreline habitat, had 78% support and also had comments um, from engagement window three that we wanted to ensure we were responsive to. Um, so the main reason the, some participants did not support this action was not wanting to see more signs on the landscape. Uh, staff acknowledges that signs across the ISP need updating um, and a comprehensive effort to consolidate and coordinate signs across the ISP is part of the preferred package of actions. So OSMB will be responsive uh, to the concern through further consideration of the number and placement of signs. Um, this action, however, remains in the preferred package of actions now uh, due to the added value interpretive signs provide um, to increase visitor awareness and appreciation of the valuable and sensitive shoreline habitat and support ISP Action 1, which was to uh, better define the no, pub no public access area. Um, and lastly, and additionally, these interpretive signs, they could be a, um, an integral component of implementing potential name change options one and two under consideration. And so any recommendation to modify the interpretive sign ISP actions um, are suggested to be made in coordination with the name change recommendation. Uh, the interpretive signs would be similar to other interpretive signs across the Owens MP system and would have local artwork. And moving on to the Wonderland Lake Trailhead and Foothills Nature Center and facilities improvements. Uh, the operational ISP actions are to renovate the Foothills Nature Center within the existing footprint, a minor reconfiguration of the parking lot, and replacing the visitor kiosk and signs. Uh, the ISP action for which we obtained additional feedback on include installing bike racks, adding a public restroom and water fountain, and providing a small trail side gathering area. Uh, in response to community feedback, the potential water fountain has been removed from the preferred package of actions, uh, providing restrooms for public use remain in the preferred package of actions. This is because uh, a restroom or facility is typically provided and considered a standard facility uh, to provide at OSMP, you know, per our OSMP trailhead standards at trailheads with high levels of visitation, um, such as Wonderland Lake. Um, and the majority of participants did support it at 69%. And, and anecdotally, staff have consistently reported visitors uh, frequently inquiring about a bathroom. Uh, this action is aimed at providing equitable comfort and access for visitors who live in other areas. Um, and the community concerns we heard were regarding attracting illegal activity, such as encampments, and health concerns, such as drug use, vandalism, and litter and not attracting visitors that are not interested in passively recreating. And these concerns can be addressed through design features along with maintenance and operational protocols. Um, an example of an operational protocol uh, would be limiting the hours the facility is open and having it closed from dusk to dawn, either through uh, locking services or by automatic locks to prevent overnight use and, and focused ranger patrol. And over the past decade, rangers um, have reported only eight instances uh, related to illegal camping at Wonderland Lake. Um, although, in order to be responsive to these concerns, the water fountain was removed from the preferred package of actions, at it, as it's considered an optional amenity, um, while at high use trailheads, while well, a bathroom is a standard facility. And lastly, uh, the planned updates at the Foothills Nature Center um, do include installing plumbed facilities to better support ongoing uh, OSMP staff operations, um, thus reducing the cost of potentially providing a restroom facilities to the public. Uh, for the minor parking lot reconfiguration, uh, there is an operational need to make some very minor changes to maintain and improve operational efficiencies. Uh, no parking spaces would be added. Uh, but we would reconfigure to allow for better snow removal, among other maintenance needs, and improved egress and ingress, uh, including for buses. Um, operationally, the department aims to keep uh, trailhead infrastructure, such as the kiosk, up to industry standards um, and provide visitors with the information they need at the start of their adventure. Um, so we listened to the previous community feedback and we have scaled back to cover just what is operationally needed. Um, and there's just not more room for scaling back without compromising operational efficiencies and standards. 
And again, with the Foothills Nature Center, we've uh, scaled back to meet the minimal needs for our operations. Uh, we will renovate the Foothills Nature Center within the existing footprint to meet the Junior Ranger programmatic needs. Um, however, in order to stay within the footprint, um, shade would need to be provided within the operational area. Um, and a shade structure, or more likely shade sails, uh, will be added to just west of the Foothills Nature Center for a Junior Ranger and other group gathering areas. Um, buses for educational programming will use the operational area between the Foothills Nature Center and outbuilding for parking and a turnaround. And there's also an operational need to add bathrooms. And we'll use the site and general footprint of the existing shed um, that's just west of the Foothills Nature Center to add plum facilities. Uh, additional actions proposed include a small group gathering area with shade trees and rocks for the ad hoc seating. And in this general area near the plumbing is the most feasible area uh, to add shade trees. And lastly, additional bike racks are proposed to be added uh, to the trailhead kiosk area. So as far as level of development, this is an aerial view of the existing Foothills uh, Nature Center and trailhead. Um, and here is what will be added to the site. Um, it consists of shade sails within the operational area, a restroom, a small restroom footpath or access, and a change of use in that existing uh, building, um, and a trail pullout with rocks using the existing shade trees, which may be supplemented with others, and an updated kiosk and signs and bike racks near the trailhead. So much of the exterior remains the same and with the same operational uses inside the existing structures. So moving on from the preferred package of ISP actions and into the proposed name change from Wonderland Lake to Wonderland Lake Wildlife Sanctuary. And so this topic stems from OSMP staff removing outdated signage, which uh, used the term wildlife sanctuary in early uh, 2019. And this was a part of ongoing efforts to remove update um, or replace updated signs across the OSMP system. Um, and in response, community organizers assembled and submitted a petition to the city manager. And this is the standard process for which the city considers name changes. Um, and the request was to rename the area the Wonderland Lake Wildlife Sanctuary. And as of early 2020, the petition had around 900 signatures um, and the city manager requested this topic be included in the ISP process. So we did. And we asked community members in engagement window number two how much they agreed or disagreed with the potential name change. And we noted that it would not have effect on how the area is managed or change the management area designations. And as you can see, 57% uh, uh, strongly agreed or agreed. So just as a reminder, if the area were to be renamed uh, Wonderland Lake Wildlife Sanctuary, it would have no regulatory meaning and it would not affect or influence OSMP's management. Uh, the term wildlife sanctuary is not defined by or associated with any of OSMP's management area designations. And uh, OSMP's management area designations were defined in the board and council approved visitor master plan and are listed here. And these provide guidance on where and how visitor services can be provided while protecting resources. And Wonderland Lake is designated as a passive recreation area. And among the goals of passive recreation areas are to provide a high level of public access, maintain or improve recreational and educational opportunities while protecting and preserving resources, and accommodate high levels of visitor use with appropriate infrastructure and services. So in response uh, to the input from engagement window number two, which was with a little over half of participants agreeing with the potential name change, uh, staff developed three name change options. Uh, the three options are no name change, the name change applying to the closure area around the lake, um, and the name change applying to the entire ISP or Wonderland Lake area. And a list of considerations were developed for each and those were included uh, in the board memo and previous presentations. So as you can see, a little over half supported the name change applied to the entire ISP in Wonderland Lake area. And we've broken down a sequence of questions that might be helpful for the board tonight in making uh, your recommendation to the city manager. Uh, the first question for the board would be, do you recommend uh, changing the name? You know, if not, then option one would be recommended to the city manager. If yes, then which remaining option or, or geographic area? Is it the sensitive shoreline enclosure area around the lake or is it the entire ISP process? 
In addition, in addition to breaking down the recommendation process or um, questions for the board, we also heard that it would be helpful to highlight any potential management implications related to this recommendation. Again, the list of management considerations along with community considerations were included in the considerations tables in the memo um, as a resource to help with this decision. Um, in short, there are no uh, major management implications as the name change will not influence OSMP's management of the area. But there may be community expectations related to the word sanctuary um, that may be different or conflict with how the department will manage the area. So we already heard in engagement window three uh, statements and sentiments around a sanctuary not being suited for fishing and other long-standing activities. Um, which is inconsistent with the goals of passive recreation areas and future management. So it's more about the potential for future misalignments or misunderstandings on how the area is managed. Um, and between options two and three, again, there are no major management implications because the management will remain the same. Um, although there are more consistencies between option two and the other ISP on the ground management actions, um, which are aimed at protecting the valuable and sensitive shoreline. Um, option three would just require uh, changing more signs and references to Wonderland Lake. Um, and we wanted to give a general idea about the next steps after this ISP planning process is complete. Uh, implementation will slowly begin in 2021. The implementation focus in 2021 will be on protecting wetland uh, resources by implementing the regulatory closure uh, and the associated actions, including um, the regulatory and interpretive signs to accurately reflect regulations and allowed activities. Um, within the two to three year time frame, the implementation focus will be on shoreline restoration, water viewing design, and to continue the work around clarifying allowed activities and likely begin the necessary operational renovations to the Foothills Nature Center. And the rest of the actions are currently anticipated to be completed within the five to seven year time frame. And before we close, I just wanted to thank all of the team um, as the development of this preferred package of actions has been a collaborative effort with an extended interdisciplinary team with many subject uh, matter experts. And I will uh, conclude tonight's presentation by listing the board motions requests and uh, turning it back over to the board. Okay, Casey, thanks to you. And uh, as you say, thanks to all the staff that worked on this. This was a multifaceted uh, activity stretching over multiple years. And um, I do very much appreciate the extra effort that all the staff put into finding additional ways to reach out to the community and also get the community's input uh, at uh, multiple points here. So. Um, Dan, do you want to say anything before we ask for clarifying questions? No, I just want to uh, thank Casey and uh, she'll be uh, uh, here to answer any other board clarifying questions. But uh, other than that, I'll turn it over to you, Kurt. And I'll Okay. Okay, very good. So uh, I think we can entertain questions. I'm going to take them in two parts. Uh, since we do have two separate things, uh, I guess I will ask first if uh, any of the board members have clarifying questions regarding the ISP elements. And then later we'll see if there's any questions about the uh, potential name changes that are proposed. So uh, clarifying questions to staff about the ISP package. You can just raise your hand. Um, uh, yes, Karen, and you're muted. I have just a couple. Um, Casey, you said a small restroom. Can you elaborate just a little bit on what that means to you, what you're envisioning for a small restroom? Sure, and perhaps maybe I should have kept my screen share up, but we are anticipating it um, being in the footprint of the existing shed just immediately west of the Foothills Nature Center. So there's already an existing uh, shed there, an existing building. And so we are anticipating it being around that same size. I understand that. I'm just wondering whether it means a, a female and a male oh, side or whether it means multiple toilets for... Yeah, um, 
I misunderstood Karen. Yes, of course. Um, it is probably two um, gender neutral stalls. Great. Okay. And then um, I'm not perfectly clear on the trail uses that are allowed. You uh, mentioned in some detail the handicap accessibility. Um, and in the packet, there's a note about horse usage. Tell me about dog uses that are allowed. Oh, yes, it is on leash. And if, yeah, I know it is on leash and it is the entire area. So, and I, I spoke about the horses the last time, but. Yeah, that's, that's clear in the packet. Okay. And, and the other small detail, um, access for ice skating? Yes. You've mentioned that you don't want people going up and over the dam. How do you expect people who are ice skating to have access? Um, I think that the, with the water levels higher in the winter and you know, off of the peninsula um, is where you know, current, current access to the water's edge is and would still, you know, remain that visitor proximity to the water's edge there. Hmm. Okay. Can I piggyback on Karen's question about dogs? Uh, we're not going to allow waiting. Do, do I assume at some place we will be saying on a sign, dogs are not allowed in the water also, and maybe why? Yeah, there, there are signs out there to um, inform visitors of the risks of allowing their dogs um, in the water due to the harmful um, algae bacteria, and we'll, we'll continue, continue that existing practice. Okay. But and Kurt, and Kurt uh, in the beginning of the summer especially, we do uh, the last two years, and especially this year, we've done a lot of collaboration regionally, because obviously this is not specific to Wonderland Lake, it's not specific to OSMP, so uh, right. And Allison have been working with our regional partners to put out press releases and to piggyback on that type of informational sharing of that issue as well. Yeah, I saw a lot of that. That was good. Thank you. Um, is, it, is it just because of the algae that we don't want dogs in the water or is it because of water quality and we really don't allow dogs in the water? You're right, Karen. There's, there's a multitude of, of, of reasons. I think we are just trying to stress upon people um, the absolute importance and safety and safety considerations to keeping, to keeping their pets safe. Um, but there are, there are reasons as far as not wanting, you know, dogs in the water in this, you know, on the shoreline in the sensitive habitat. So there, there are many reasons why there is a dog on leash um, policy. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Dave, and you're muted. Thank you. I'm not used to that. <laughs> Still. Uh, Casey, I have two quick, well, I have one comment and then one question. Um, as an old ice skater at Wonderland Lake, um, the, the, the ice skating access off the peninsula is virtually non-existent. The real, the real access is on the southeast corner. And so my impression was that people, if they wanted to the ice skate could use the fishing access points uh, for ice skating because the peninsula, the water at the peninsula is too shallow and it doesn't form ice. And so it, it really doesn't uh, work to have ice skating there. Uh -huh. So that was my comment. My question is um, in the material for the renovation of the Foothills Nature Center, there's a $250,000 estimate and I'm just wondering uh, if there is additional detail or how was that estimate arrived at? Sure. Yeah, I worked with uh, Ben Mayer, our facilities asset manager, because we know that a lot of it was unknown and what we looked at were we looked at renovation costs like per square foot for other house renovations that we've done and other renovations we've done to existing facilities in recent years. Um, and then we looked at kind of what we already knew about this facility, you know, having asbestos lead and looking at what Natasha needed for her junior ranger programming. So it is a rough estimate and it's just based on what we knew about it and then also square foot costs for very recent construction. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, other questions about the ISP package? Yeah, Caroline, and you're muted. Very good. Um, 
Casey, could you let me know a little bit more what changes would happen to the parking lot um, to improve the snow removal? Sure. Uh, the fence might be pushed out a little bit because right now we have to we have to use parking spaces um, for the snow. There's no good place mm -hmm. to put it. So it might be creating a, an area, a little bump out to put the snow in so that we're not losing, not losing that space. And then the egress and egress for buses, that would just be um, on the, the side of the main road. It would. We might just realign that slightly, uh, make it bigger, maybe move a parking space slightly away from it. Um, it just might be a little, little tight there. So it just is a matter of just kind of moving moving things around and make, aligning things to make sure that the buses can safely enter and exit and not get um, blocked. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on the ISP package? Okay, questions about the name change proposals. Okay, seeing none, then I think we are ready to turn to the uh, public hearing and so Allison, I know you're going to manage that. Roughly how many folks do you think we're going to have? Well, um, we do have some on and we have one hand raised, but we have some people who've joined since the beginning of the meeting. So I just want to go over the instructions Please. on how to raise hands one more time. If you are interested in participating in public comment, unfortunately, we can't turn your video on because of security issues. We want to minimize disruptions, but I will unmute you uh, if you want to participate. So if you scroll down to the bottom of your screen and see your participants box, if you open that box, you should have the option in the bottom of that box to raise your hand. So that's what we would like you to do now. And I will call on you in the order that the hands are raised. And at that point, when um, I say your name, I will unmute you. Please say and spell your first and last name, and then a two-minute timer will start on screen. Um, if you, I do see some phone numbers. If you've called in and you would like to participate, you can um, raise your hand by pressing star nine and then press star six to unmute yourself when it's your turn. But if you could text me your name, I won't be able to unmute you just with your phone number alone, I will need a phone number. So if that's the case, please text 720-576-8593 and I, with your full name and I'll rename you first. And I think that's everything we need to know. <laughs> okay. I'm seeing one hand <clears throat> raised so far. Wow, that's see? not very many. So uh, Allison, I think we will allow three minutes. I will okay. say one quick thing before we start, and that is uh, to the folks commenting tonight that there are in the ISP package, there are 24 proposed elements. And so if by chance you are speaking to a specific element, it would be great if you can also tell us what the number is of that so we can try to keep track of your comments. So anyway, uh, do that if you can. Uh, all right, Allison, let's go ahead and start. And if we only have a handful at this point. Yep, we just have one hand raised. Okay, we'll give the person three minutes. Okay, Thank so you. Ju Judith, I'm going to unmute you. Okay. Okay. You hear me now? Yes. Hi. Hi, everybody. I'm Judith Ansara. I live at 895 Rain Lily Lane, Boulder. Um, my last name is spelled A-N-S-A-R-A. -A. Um, first of all, I, just to contextual, I know a bunch of you, and I've been um, one of the citizens that had coordinated the Friends of Fallout Wonderland Lake uh, in response to the and the, all the other infrastructure. Um, I am not speaking for that group, but have an eye in and an ear out to the community through that channel. Um, first of all, I'd really, really like to appreciate everybody who's worked on this. It's a dramatic turnaround from where we started with boardwalks and piers and waiting and um, really want to appreciate staff, Open Space, City Council last year, who really called a halt to the process and the responsiveness 
and where you've ended up is really encouraging. And I want to also give a public shout out to all the citizen activists in addition to the staff. Um, when you see that 900 people uh, showed up for nine ch million change, we had Oh, we packed a meeting at the North Boulder Rec Center with the, where, where there wasn't enough room for people to, um, to even sit down or get in the room. So that's been a very active part of this entire process. And I really appreciate your responsiveness. Um, as a quick aside, I would love to have a conversation with anyone about community engagement process. I don't want to go into that now. But even though we've come out in a good place, I think there are ways that that could be really improved for future engagements. And that's part of my professional life. Um, the two issues I really want to raise for consideration before any decisions are made. Um, the first one is about the name change. Um, it is unheard of in Boulder's history to have 900 people support and uh, dozens of organizations and institutions and businesses support a proposal. Um, that says a lot. Uh, the reason that that has been so huge is that, oh, I got to talk quickly, um, is that the signs disappeared just before the proposal for the pier and the boardwalk and everything else. It created a lot of distrust, which was unfortunate. Um, since there is no legal implication to that, the deepest concern that I and the majority of people who answered the survey, I got to talk really, really quickly, um, is that leaving out the East Dam and the riparian wildlife habitat between Broadway and the lake leaves out a crucial part of the sanctuary and preservation and conservation. And originally there were plans to try to put trails in that area, which don't seem to be there anymore, but it's deeply, deeply, deeply concerning that that be not included. Great, Judith, uh, thank you for your comments and all of your participation in this process. Okay, we have one more hand, Robert Sharp. And Robert, you are unmuted. Okay, is there a timer available? Can you see the timer on the screen? No, it says done speaking. <laughs> That's okay, we, we'll, no. we can tell you when you're getting close. <laughs> okay. All right, well, thank you. Um, I heard the mention of uh, trail realignments and, and improvements and accessibility, and, and this means, I think, cutting new, new trails. And uh, I, I just wanted to say more about how the work was done on Marshall Mesa that, for me, just has gone against everything I've ever known about principles of of uh, open space and of, of, uh, of trail uh, uh, building and maintenance and so forth. Um, it's bad enough, you know, to, to the, the trade off for certain, certain things to go into another area, I think deserves greater consideration. It, it seems on Marshall Mesa, cutting the four, uh, uh, neglecting a, a, a historic route to the point that you have to make 2,000 feet of new trail. And because it's now people after decades of using it, it's too steep, some people say. The, these are not good trade-offs. I mean, I just think that there's worthy of discussion about the trade-offs of, uh, of helping one thing and destroying another. Uh, then the way, that, the way that it was done over here to, 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 to cut you know, two foot, I mean, four foot by 2,000 feet is horrific in itself, but then to, to, to hack and, and dig and, and throw <laughs> the excess dirt and vegetation and huge clumps of things 30 feet and 40 feet off the trail and trample all of it and trample in between trails and run machines everywhere and pull ro natural rocks out of the slope and roll them around destroy the habitat of spiders and insects, no, no thought or regard whatsoever for the insects or the plants or trying to save what can be saved and, and stay within a corridor. And um, 
and bisecting. Robert? Yes. Robert, you've got one minute left. Do you have anything you want to say specifically about the uh, proposed actions at Wonderland Lake? Well, I want to say that uh, I, I want to would like to ask for more consideration of how the trade-offs are being measured when, in, when any new trail is being cut where there is is none now. That's that's the main thing, and I guess I'd like the board to to consider some review of uh, of these trade-offs where. You know, it, it seems that insect is not considered at all. It seems the value of plants not considered at all. The value of the topsoil, the uh, bisecting further of of, uh, of areas. The, I, I don't the, the land the visual impact. I don't. It's there's no way of telling if these things are considered at all or what value is given to them in in, in weighing one thing against another. Okay, uh, that's your three minutes. Thank you, Robert. Okay. That's all the hands I see. Okay, thank you, Allison. So that brings us back to uh, the board, uh, I'm sorry, the staff's uh, motions. Um, I'm gonna suggest that we discuss them separately and so I guess I'm going to first ask um, the motion is to recommend that staff advance the preferred package of actions for the Wonderland Lake integrated site project into detailed design and execution. Um, anybody have any general discussion or thoughts uh, before we entertain motions? Just raise your hand. Yeah Dave and you're muted. I really feel badly about what I'm going to say because I do appreciate the effort that staff and the community have, have put in. But I must say, having said that, then I'm extremely disappointed in the proposals uh, in, in many cases. And that is because I am concerned that it doesn't appear that a holistic view of the landscape was actually taken and the focus being on Wonderland Lake in a passive recreation area just in fact ignores or devalues both the status of the lake and the surrounding area. And I guess, uh, you know, it's an, the lake is an important part of an ecosystem that is, you know, is the junction of the Great Plains grasslands and in the Rocky Mountain uh, foothills. And to say that it's a passive recreation and that the only values are restoring the lake margins, I think really diminishes the importance of the area. Um, I'm gonna to speak to some of the educational opportunities that I think either were not considered or were um, discounted that I think are extremely important. And that is the restoration of that entire area is, it is a wonderful opportunity for the community to both understand the value of not only uh, water on an arid, semi-arid landscape, but also the, the native grasslands. And most of the uh, grassland and wetland habitats are non-native at this point. So there are extremely valuable restoration efforts there that in an area that's right smack dab in an urban matrix where people don't have to go anywhere to see what's going on and to participate in volunteer projects and look out their back doors and, and actually see, you know, a, a restoration, a transformation actually from a non-native uh, weedy grassland to, or wetland to a uh, more native um, diverse and functional ecosystem. So my concern is that we're not really looking at the spectrum of natural values and we're discounting them because it's a, it's a passive recreation designation area. It's, it's a place and that's the whole point of the sanctuary, which I will talk about when we get to that, but 
it's the name of a place that the categories that we're talking about, passive recreation area, habitat conservation area, those are management categories. They speak not at all to the actual values that are in those areas. And yes, the categories um, are based on the values, but I just think in the uh, many of the staff proposals that we're, we're just completely missing the point. So um, I'll, I'll basically leave it at that, but I think there's a tremendous living laboratory opportunity right there at Wonderland Lake that uh, we would be remiss to not take advantage of. And you can look at doing prescribed burns and, you know, weed eradication, reseeding, all those activities are hands-on and interpretive signs do not do it for the community. The fact that the community members can get in and participate in those kinds of activities is invaluable, both to increase um, their understanding and appreciation of what it takes to actually do that. Because a lot of the, you know, native uh, ecosystem restoration efforts we're doing are, you know, are not in inaccessible places, but places that people have to work to to get <clears throat> to. This is right in their backyards. What an opportunity. And um, Judah spoke to the importance of Wonderland Creek that little stream in the riparian air is extremely important. It, that's a wildlife corridor and it functions, uh, well, it doesn't function all that great at the moment, but it, it has great potential for increasing the wildlife habitat values there. And in fact, uh, again, we would be derelict not to um, <coughs> actually uh, uh, focus on that. So I'll leave it at that. I will have some comments about on the sanctuary uh, nomenclature, but uh, I'm extremely concerned that we have taken a very limited management view of, <clears throat> of this area. So Dave, let me just ask a little bit. Um, I mean, I think to some extent, th this effort grew out of the North TSA, which was a trail study area. And so it tended to have a trail centric focus and a recreation focus. Uh, I think it has been broadened some from that, but let me just ask you, a lot of the things you describe to me don't seem to be prevented by the IST package. They are things that open space could additionally do in the area. And I think many of them you describe sound like very worthwhile efforts. I very much appreciate your point that this is right in the middle of the city. And so a lot of the things we might do remotely, we could do here. But do you see the ISP preventing those things from happening? Or you're just more disappointed that it didn't take into consideration those broader possibilities? Uh, both. <laughs> so I, I will say, Kurt, that uh, based on experience, I think uh, the plans and, you know, the, the management documents need to call out specifically, you know, what is uh, anticipated or intended to happen. So, yeah, I agree that potentially uh, that could happen, those things might happen, but particularly where the educational component mm. is, I am just extremely disappointed that you know there isn't the acknowledgement that here is a wonderful opportunity to, for community members to get their hands in the dirt and you know mm. really understand what it takes to re restore these areas and and give them you know some some uh, responsibility for protecting and maintaining the area which then gets to more of the sanctuary nomenclature so okay. i am uh, i i am of the opinion that based on experience that uh, uh, it is uh, far more desirable to have these things described in the management plan than to think, well, you know, we could possibly do that at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, did Casey or Dan, did you want to reflect on what Dave's raised here? I mean, to, to some extent, I think it was sort of the scope that we went into this with. And uh, so, Casey, did you want to talk? 
Sure, I'll, I'll start and Dan or others, if you have anything you'd like to add, please, please do so. Um, so we did take a more holistic view. I wasn't just implementing the North Trail study or we were trying to look at the area as a whole as far as restoration opportunities. Uh, Dave, you were right that, you know, most of the, a lot of the grasslands out farther east are not, are not native right now. Um, when we were speaking with our ecologists, they did not really prioritize that area when, especially when you were looking system-wide as a, as a restoration potential. Uh, area. So it was just having to do with, with priority system-wide and, and restoration efforts. Um, we do too see the value um, of the, um, the proximity um, and having a lot of visitors in the area to see, have that educational component that Dave was speaking to. Um, and that is why, you know, we do have the restoration on the peninsula with, you know, the temporary signs to, to help educate um, and share those experiences and what it means to restore restore a small area, but that, that's why the area um, out east was not was not included. It just wasn't a priority among our ecological staff as a restoration area. But we did we did we did look at that, and we are hoping to reach um, reach some people. We are hoping to reach people through our actions, through the protections of the interpretive signs, the closure, and the restoration areas to emphasize as they pointed out this area does have a lot of high ecological values. It has both high visitation and some high ecological values. <laughs> I, I do understand that, Casey, and I, I, I appreciate your explanation, but it just strikes me that b both the location and, you know, kind of the importance of, of you know, water in a semi-arid landscape, you got a little riparian air, you have such tremendous educational opportunities that may not be a priority uh, you know, resource wise, but educationally for the community, I can't think of a, a more, a better place, you know, and a more important place for the community to really understand what it takes to, you know, do prescribed burns, to reseed uh, native grassland, to try and, and, you know, encourage the native plants and take care of the place. And, and that gets, as I said before, to the sanctuary notion. So I understand the prioritization, but for me, um, you know, interpretive signs in a place like this don't really do it unless, um, you know, there's some active educational opportunities. Okay, Caroline. Yeah, going a little bit off of what um, Dave said, uh, when we look at the value of the natural habitat, and the visual disturbances, um, and then integrate, you know, our landscape scale approaches in collaboration with the stakeholders, which is, you know, our, our local neighborhood in that area. Um, I think it would be diligent to design interventions that have the intention of learning about the system's response um, and how they mm -hmm. deal with we create a lot more recreation um, and increase visitation without really stopping to understand what that's going to do um, to the environment. I think that that might be a disservice um, to Wonderland Lake and the community that surrounds it. Um, instead, maybe, um, again, like I said, with the intention of learning and then adjust management practices in response to the new information um, that we have around that. And I, I think Robert Sharp um, said it well when he was talking about the, the trade-offs um, between recreation or protection. Um, I think that the idea of, of trying to get more native species back and, and burn control and things like that and learning what that does um, to the area as far as improvements um, would be of high value. Um, and, and, and just like all politics in America today, it seems like our environmental politics are becoming uh, more polarized. So um, providing programs that provide environmentally beneficial results, and it just seems like what the neighborhood is really saying is, do they want you know, a playground or a paradise? And um, I just think that it is, um, it behooves all of us to, to really listen to those that are in the area and what they're describing um, as, as what they need. So, thank you. Uh, Mark, Mark, did you want to jump in here? Yeah, just to add to what Casey was saying, just to both Dave and Caroline respond to what you say, perhaps then the way forward here is 
to acknowledge, you know, we do do education programs out of Wonderland Lake and it's a mix of programs. It's an accessible site, it's a site for youth programs, uh, it's a site for some of the equity programs we do. And it's also a site for our environmental education programs. And within all the programs we do, we always offer an environmental component. So that is just focused on the program, you know, taking people out on the site. I think what we could build into the plan uh, is what I'm hearing is, you know, we've done this before with other board recommendations. Can we emphasize the, the existing work we do in the plan? And then as Casey pointed out, as restoration opportunities arise, and we, in our work planning, we build those in. Can we make sure volunteer efforts or education programs talk about that type of land management and the restoration that's occurring? So we'd be, you know, like any of these plan efforts, we'd be happy to add that to the plan and make it part of the rec recommendation. And I think what we've done with the previous ISPs is taken those recommendations from this discussion. And then, you know, as it stands, it's a draft, then finalize it. And hopefully as board members, you'll trust that we'll incorporate that. Well, Mark, what we have actually out, as you know, on the landscape is, is kind of an artificial impoundment. Right. That, uh, over the years has, you know, um, supported a, a, a number of wild, wildlife habitat values. And we've got degraded wetlands and degraded grasslands associated with that. And so it's like, for me, this is, it, it's more than just kind of an it's educational programs. It, in the sense that this gets people, you know, involved in the active restoration rather than the staff necessarily having to do all the restoration. I mean, the staff obviously can lead it, but this gets the community involved. And I just think, uh, you know, increases the understanding and appreciation of what it takes to actually maintain, well, restore, maintain and protect these areas. And, I just hate to see us, uh, you know, kind of uh, not take it, no, let's not take advantage, but um, miss that opportunity. Uh, what a, it's, as I keep saying, it, I think it's a wonderful opportunity for us to really educationally uh, reach out to the community. Dave, just to, to confirm, I totally agree, like the traditional programming plus when we do restoration efforts, and I think you noticed one of the changes we've had at the like, gun barrel meeting and at the Winland meetings to offer opportunities for the community to sign up and volunteer, you know, with Janelle Freeston and her staff being there. So we are looking for ways to better integrate that. So we'd be happy to add that to the plan. Erin, thanks. Um, I keep thinking about what we did with the ISP, remind me the name of the area that's east of the East Boulder Rec Center. Gebhardt. Thank you, Gebhardt. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about the restoration of that little segment of land between the road and the creek bed at Gebhardt. And so I see what Dave is describing as very much something that could and I would advocate should be mentioned in this ISP as just as it was at Gebhardt. And that is that there's a, a great opportunity for habitat restoration. It fits with the concept in the master plan of developing a learning laboratory approach to conservation. It fits with the, the uh, part of the master plan that talks about connecting youth to the outdoors, um, as well as, and, and what I uh, hear Mark describing when he's referring to the education programs that go on there out there now it sounds to me that they're more about communication and less about involving learners in a learning laboratory kind of situation and I'd like to see the language from the master plan used in describing what Dave is suggesting and be made part of this ISP um, I, when I got to page 34 in the packet um, and I saw all the red X's about water access, we're not having water access, so we're not gonna have that kind of visitor experience in nature set center, nature study. Um, we're not gonna foster education and interpretive experiences anymore. There's red X's there because um, of, of the reconstruction of the peninsula 
And I think instead of those things that, that granted the neighborhood did not want to see, and so they've been eliminated, I think instead we need to put into this ISP statements about developing a learning laboratory approach to conservation and restoration of the area, um, involving the public in improving the, the native uh, restoration of, of both the, the aquatic and the uh, terrestrial ecosystems there. Thanks, Karen. We'd be happy to do that. And I know recently retired Dave Sutherland uh, was working with Lisa on this project to talk about, you know, and the idea of water and explain the history of water at the site. And I, I want to see, see in, in the part that I'm suggesting, I want to see less explaining and communication and more actually learning laboratory, like Dave was saying, get your hands dirty, work on the restoration of the ecosystem there. And, and in addition to water, Mark, um, and I talked with John Potter and, and uh, Chris Weiner yesterday, it, we, you know, what an opportunity for fire. People now are yeah. starting to figure out, you know, fire is uh, something they got to be paying attention to. And here we have an opportunity to do some prescribed burning in an urban matrix that is safe and educational and people can understand you know what fire is as far as its relationship to maintaining uh, native ecosystems a tremendous opportunity i think okay. are you guys drafting language to add to the uh, motion <laughs> i can see casey busy <laughs> i'm starting to take some notes but i mean that's my sense here and i think we're all saying it is that I don't know that anything that's been proposed can't be an additional area of emphasis for the ISP. And so that's why I wanted to make sure uh, I was asking Dave if there are things in the ISP elements that he believes would prevent this. I don't know that there are, but this certainly could be added as a, as an, a significant area of emphasis. Caroline? Um, just in response to what you're saying, for me, it's it's the size of the footprint. It's the it's the increase in activity, along with the the degradation that is currently present, and how to maintain that balance or or still uh, make the area better. So, um, not understanding what the larger footprint is going to do and the impact um, is where my concerns are. But would you want to add something that talks very specifically about um, monitoring impact of visitation on these important resources as as part of the uh, ISP? Um, I again, I think that it would just require a huge scale down. I, I think that you would have to see what's happened to the system um, and then be able from there, uh, like I said, um, adjust the management practices with new information. Um, from that, I just wonder if all of those um, ISP projects are implemented and that is the new current state of the system, then how would you scale down from there? And I think that um, just looking at our, our resources and, and everything that has changed in 2020 um, and just really placing a high value on, on the natural habitat um, and, and the very fragile ecosystem that's there. Well, I think, Caroline, we're, we're, that is a segue into the uh, conversation on the name change and, you know, the, the uh, uh, <laughs> before, before you go there, Dave, could, yeah. could we hear from Hal? He's been having his hand. Oh, Hal, yeah. yeah, I see your hand, Hal. Yeah, um, you know, I really, in reading the details and changes from where we began to where we are now, I think incredible progress was made in many regards. Personally, I'm really happy because the new project is materially less capitally intensive uh, than the prior one. Um, particularly like noticing your desire to keep the footprint of the, the built structure where it is, even the idea of using shade sails to extend that structure, I think is a really beautiful idea. 
Um, I am pretty much fully supportive of this. I'm not hearing particularly what I would describe as immediate actionable items from other board members. So I'm going to just put my full support behind the uh, plan as it stands with one small point that I'd like to make. Um, I think a lot of the learning laboratory and at least my friends who use the lake are fishing there with their children. And on these stone fishing paths that lead down there, I just encourage you when you build them that the stone should fan out a bit to accommodate one adult fisherman and two mm -hmm. small fishermen, such that <laughs> the, the, the incursion into the water and the shoreline is minimalized uh, and is also comfortable. And for me, that's a lot of the learning laboratory that's there. Um, I'm sure that's a very small thing, but just the sort of us small children landing pad. Um, and really, I just want to say I, I, I appreciate your flexibility to work with the community to get here. And uh, again, I'm enthusiastic about it. Other comments. Um, Caroline, were you, given what you were talking about, were you going to propose that certain elements be dropped out because you felt they would increase visitation in a way that could be harmful to the resources? What's your thinking? You know, it's it's kind of twofold. Um, you know, the, the the structures that are already there have some issues. Um, you know, I go there with my children, and while I do think that you know a bathroom in some ways would be good and I, I hear what we're saying about the equity with it. I also do feel that the time that most people spend around the lake is is what it should be for the next round of, you know, passive recreation visitors that come in. Um, and then again, that's that overcrowding and then um, people passing on the walkway and extending it. It just I just, I just have concerns. Um, I don't think that there's anything in particular, if, if that's your question, um, as to what would change. But, but yeah, I, kn I know that the bathroom um, for the people in the community was an issue, and I, I do see where their concerns lie with that. Can, can I uh, sort of comment yeah, on Go ahead. That? My sense of the community's concern is really more a concern about um, the management and approach to those who are unhoused in our community generally and its particular location relative to some of those facilities. Um, I, in a place like this, I personally do support having bathrooms there. There's a lot of people, uh, elderly people, young people, where uh, incontinence, different things, it's a big part of dignity and having a bathroom at hand available in this particular location, to me, makes sense. Um, it's not, not to say that what the community is seeing won't be a problem. I think it will be a problem. Um, but that's going to require a larger interagency discussion and uh, a bigger solution. I, I just worry that we can't unilaterally not put the right uh, facilities for, our, for, for the community there simply because there's this other tertiary issue that needs to be discussed, in my opinion. Uh, other thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, in, in reading all the public comments, how what you said definitely um, holds weight. Um, but I, I also did read um, for the North Boulder community, it's, it's been, it becomes a place where um, you can stay for half the day or stay for the whole day. Um, and then again, just that increase um, in visitation and, and what that will do, so. Yeah. So, uh, Caroline, I'm going to come back to the idea about monitoring visitor use. Uh, I mean, I, I think that is a general concern of the community. And I, I mean, if, if, you, if you have that concern, I, I think it would be perfectly reasonable to say that uh, we should be monitoring visitation and use and impacts on resources. Now, staff may say, well, that's part of our visitor monitoring, but uh, Karen, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I, I've jotted down some language that I'd be willing to try out if you're ready for that. Um, yeah. 
Go ahead. Um, I would move to recommend that staff advance the preferred package of actions for the Wonderland Lake Integrated Site Project uh, into detailed design and execution with the addition of a section for developing a learning laboratory approach to education and restoration that includes opportunities for service learning and monitoring the quality of the aquatic and terrestrial habitat. Okay, I got laboratory approach that, did you say increases the? That includes opportunities for service learning and monitoring the quality of the aquatic and terrestrial habitat. Service learning, what's that? Um, it's a term right out of um, the education section of our master plan. Oh dear. Mark's, <laughs> Mark's smiling because he knows what page I got it from. <laughs> exactly, and it's good. It's a chance for when you're actually educational type learning, just what you've been describing when you work in a restoration project or whatever. For people to get their hands dirty. Exactly. And contribute to the restoration. Okay. Um, and, and I think if we can include that kind of a element to this, uh, Mark has already said that um, that fits in with educational programming kinds of things that the staff is working on and as if we can see his face again, I can see whether his head's nodding yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is, Karen. <laughs> um, well, one thing we've proved is that Leah can type a lot faster than I can. Oh, she's Thank a you, Leah. <laughs> So, Leah, go ahead and bring that back up. I, I think that's good. And then Dave, Dave's, go ahead. Dave's got some editing to do. Okay, so let's let Leah bring it up, and Dave, you can direct her. So what I, what I would uh, suggest adding is uh, after Habitat would be in this uh, unique area in an urban matrix so, so that we're highlighting, you know, the, right. the specific importance of this area. Sorry, Dave, at the very end. Yes. Yeah, it was so after Habitat would say in this unique area in an urban matrix. That's pretty good. I might, I might have to turn my video off because it's cutting out. Did that get what you said? Yes. Okay. I like it. So I'm going to read it because we have people who are listening. Um, Karen moved the Open Space Board of Trustees to recommend that staff, and I think we've just dropped the two, so Open Space Board of Rusty, Trustees recommend that staff advance the preferred package of, of actions for the Wonderland Lake Integrated Site Project into detailed design and execution with the addition of a section for developing a learning laboratory approach to education and restoration that includes opportunities for service learning and monitoring Help me, Karen. It says monitoring quality. Quality of a Monitoring the, should it say monitoring the quality? Sure. Okay, monitoring the quality of aquatic and terrestrial habitat in a unique area in an urban matrix. Uh, Kurt, uh, I think yeah. habitat should be plural. So there are two habitats there, actually. Fine. Yeah, very good. Um, I'm going to ask staff, did we accidentally drop out anything in the uh, original um, proposed motion that we're missing right now that you think we need to add back in? Could I just, if it's okay. Yeah, yeah go ahead, Mark. Just a question. Um, yeah, it, I'm just looking at the master plan here and you're hitting CCI 6 for Inspire Environmental Literacy. It's CCI 7, Cultural Leaders and Stewardship. And CCI 8, Heightened Community Understanding of Land Management Efforts. So and the, the question I'd have is, do you want this writing in the motion or similar to the way we did the master plan and the other ISPs, 
this could be something uh, Casey could take back and incorporate into itself, and that's the board would trust us that we do, and that keeps the recommendation. So, Mark, with the simple I, thing, I would be, just Mark, I would just add CCI three. Okay, perfect. which is where service learning opportunities right. come out in. Okay. And what I was going to suggest in the other ISPs, we went in and added that to the language in, you know, made amendment. And then basically when we posted the final version, it included this type of language. So it's up to you to either leave it in the motion or we put it back into the well, ISP itself as an action. Well, uh, our, is the simple way to just sort of add at the end of that, in order to pursue master plan elements, blank, 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 and list those elements numbers at least, uh, and you can expand it, uh, but it, why don't you tell Leah what those numbers are? <laughs> and so Leah, this would be, uh, you, you could have an additional sentence. It would be something like, this is to particularly address master plan elements. And I would say CCEI three, six, seven, and eight. Perfect. And then, Kurt, to answer your question um, about the original motion recommended language, did I hear that yeah. correctly? Yeah, no, I think you got everything. The original motion language was to recommend uh, that staff advance the preferred package of actions for the Wonderland Lake integrated site project into detailed design and execution, which is exactly what you have there. Okay, so, thanks okay. for... Thanks for double checking us. And uh, let, let me just ask Mark one additional question. Do you want to <clears> add <throat> EHR 7, which is developing a learn, learning laboratory approach to conservation? Thank you, Karen. Yes. <laughs> and, and Mark, I, uh, I guess I would like to suggest that we add the appropriate environmental uh, elements to that as well, which is. That's EHR 7. Okay. Is that what you recommended, Karen? Yep. Yep. Well, and it's also six, actually. I think it, yeah, it's a good point. You could say such as, and then, you know, obviously as staff develops the programs, works on the themes for the site, you know, we can come back to the board at some point talking about how we've been able to implement it. So it might be good to put such as in there. That's a good idea. Uh, <laughs> And that would be at the beginning to particularly address master plan elements, such as, is that where you're yes, saying? Yes. Put, okay. And then Leah, at the end of eight, and EHR six and seven. And spell check doesn't like EHR. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron, do you think it would be redundant to add? after your sentence of integrated site project into detailed design and execution of um, the ad ecosystem-based management. I mean, I know that's what we're talking about, so I don't know if that's just kind of redundant in the sentence or if that helps to clarify it, to add after execution ecosystem-based management. Well, it's really the integrated, the execution of the ISP. Okay, I wasn't sure if that okay. yeah. it. And I, I agree with you. Everything that comes after that has to do with ecosystem management. Yeah. Okay. Any any friendly amendments to Karen's draft motion? Okay, Karen, I'm going to let you move that and read it. I move. Go ahead. I move that the Open Space Board of Trustees recommend that staff advance the preferred package of actions for the Wonderland Lake Integrated Site Project into detailed design and execution with the addition of a section for developing a learning laboratory approach to education and restoration that includes opportunities for service learning and monitoring oops, service learning, and monitoring the quality of aquatic and terrestrial habitats in a unique area in an urban matrix. This is of particularly, this is to particularly, to particularly. address master plan elements such as CCEI 3, 6, 7, 8, and EHR 6 and 7. I'll second that. Okay. 
Okay, I'm going to call roll here uh, in support of Karen's motion or in opposition. Hal. I will support. Karen? Yes. Dave Koontz? Yes, and thank you very much. Caroline Miller? Yes. And Kurt Brown says yes. Leah, this passes unanimously. Thank you to all. I think this is a significant improvement. And Dave, thank you for uh, willing to pitch this. Uh, and Caroline, too. So thank you very much. You're welcome. So uh, this takes us then to the second motion. And Dave, uh, you wanted to talk about the name. So why don't you lead out here? Uh, I will be happy to do that if I actually, uh, Leah can, or uh, Allison, can we get a view of the, yes, thank you. <laughs> I'd like to see who I'm talking to. <laughs> <laughs> so. Excuse me, before we go on, um, I want to make sure we don't lose Hal's point about making the ends of the steps down off the dam oh. big enough to accommodate is that something that Casey can just include in staff notes or something sorry I keep hitting the wrong unmute button <laughs> um, yes we, we can we can take note of that of that idea and put that um, for consideration into the into the detailed design process okay thanks I think I, I sense there's general support for the idea I think it is a very good point uh, having kids fishing is one of the higher goals in life Thanks, Al. Okay, Dave. You're all non-native fish, though, Kurt. Yeah, you know, you get what you take. You yeah. take what you get. Right? Good old rainbow trout. <laughs> That's right. Maybe we can get some so, greenbacks in there. Uh, so sanctuary. You know, and this is the segue I was trying to say with what Caroline was saying about, you know, the, the impacts and climate change and all of that because you know there is a real community responsibility to take care of these areas and and you know a sanctuary de defines a place and so it's the the name uh, means that it's a special place and there are there are expectations for certain behaviors um, in sanctuaries and I think that the public understands that, you know, when you're in a sanctuary, you are expected to behave differently. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it comes from the, the, the Latin sanctum, but it, you know, it's, a, it's supposedly a, a place of refuge and protection where, you know, you, uh, you show respect and reflection. And I think that's exactly what we want in, in a place like this. And, and I think the community gets it. And so I I'm, have always been perplexed at the need to remove that uh, because of uh, what my perception is, and excuse me, Dan, for saying this, but is, is there rather a more bureaucratic notion of management? Because certainly, as I said before, the management categories that the department has come up with you know, certainly have flexibility to accommodate or, or incorporate a whole host of, you know, more place specific actions. And again, I think the importance of the, this area, and, and it won't be misunderstood for a habitat conservation area, they are completely different. Right. This is an area that's in an urban matrix, as I keep saying, Habitat conservation areas are different because of size, location, diversity, a, a whole host of things. And I think people get it. They, they won't mistake the fact that Wonderland is called a sanctuary and we're calling other places HCAs. So uh, I'm, I'm just concerned that in, in our rush to say, well, we're managing this as a passive recreation area, the whole reason that people are going there primarily is because of the resource values. And we should be making sure that we're not only managing or maintaining or enhancing those, but that uh, we're protecting 
you know, that which the public and the community are, are coming to both enjoy and learn about. And uh, we want to foster that notion of uh, taking care of this place. It is a special place because of, you know, what's there. You don't see water on this in a semi-arid landscape very frequently. And because of that, a whole bunch of things are happening. So that's Maybe what I want to Before I ask someone else to talk, uh, let me just ask, are, are you supporting option two or three then? Do you have a preference? Three. Well, three because, uh, and I'll speak to that. Um, yeah. Wonderland Lake is a, you know, it's a tiny riparian area, but every riparian area in this larger area, the semi-arid landscape is extremely important and it does provide a habitat corridor value that could be greatly increased. Um, and so I think that uh, to exclude it from any kind of designation would again be remiss. Thank you. Who else would like to speak to this issue? Karen. I just have a quick question about boundaries. Um, and, and I don't know whether Dave or Dan or Casey or who the, who the right person is to comment about this. Um, but I'm wondering whether the boundaries then of the, of the wildlife sanctuary um, are what's shown in blue follow the OSMP property line, um, avoid including things like the trails adjacent to Broadway and the, the structures on the northeast corner or where the boundaries of the wildlife sanctuary are. Yeah, Casey, wouldn't that be the ISP boundaries for option three? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that map's on page 37. Yes. Yeah, so the everything within the blue line would be wildlife sanctuary. Un, yes. Under that's option three. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, that's on page thirty-eight. Thank you very much. <laughs> and does that does that mean the the brown trail where it goes outside of the blue lines is that still OSMP land and that's just outside of the wildlife <coughs> sanctuary? I don't want to get too nitpicky about this. I just want a clear understanding. Are you are you speaking of the parks and rec land to the uh, south of the lake, Karen? No, I'm specifically looking at the east north side. side. The north side. Okay. Well, that's private uh, yeah, property. No, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. It's the the blue line is on the south side of that. Um, the property. It's private there. property where there's a massive house being built. No, well, but there's the dark, the dark brown is an open space trail, right? Well, it goes along Silver Lake Ditch, but it's just, uh, yeah, it's basically the trail. That's all it is. Okay. Any other thoughts or questions? How were you raising your hand on this? Yeah, I, I, I wanted to add um, a quick thought. I mean, despite the non regulatory nature of it within this concept of the place being a teaching place. I kind of lean towards keeping the word sanctuary. It was once called that. There's an element of continuity. The sign being removed panicked the community, which tells us that they were attached to it. And I just don't see much downside uh, for it. Um, because perhaps parents tell their children, you know, let's go down to the Wonderland Lake a wildlife sanctuary. It becomes cultural and uh, regardless of any change in regulatory management, maybe there's a spiritual shift. So I, I support keeping it as is, the option of no change. Yeah, I think well, it sends a message to the community and I, and again, I think they get it. You know? I, I just want to be clear. I think option one means having it be called Wonderland Lake, period. Is that my understanding, Casey? Yes. Oh, and, yeah. uh -oh. so yeah. Hal's describing one as three. Right. Hal, Hal's describing either option two or three. So option one, it would just remain Wonderland Lake. And then option two and option three 
um, well, an option to a portion would be called Wonderland Lake Sanctuary, which is just the um, valley, the habitat around the lake. And then option three is the whole area would be called uh, Wildlife Wonderland Lake Wildlife Sanctuary. And I guess I'll weigh in. I agree with Dave, and I think I agree with Hal too. Um, I don't think it makes any sense to not have a sign where the sign used to be right there as you go in that says Wonderland Lake Wildlife Sanctuary. Uh, so uh, to me, that's another argument for having it applied to the whole area, which is option three. Um, any other discussion? Or if somebody wants to make a motion, that would yeah, be just, just a clarification. Yeah, Kurt, that thank you. The um, Wildlife Sanctuary sign that was taken down was not the main trailhead sign. Um, it was a, uh, a reference to uh, a sign that was closer to the lake. Oh, so, I couldn't tell that. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, and so well, option three would replace the existing Broadway sign uh, and, and to include the name Wildlife Sanctuary. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, uh, and I, I think that makes sense that, uh, you know, someone that comes there, um, if, if this is what we're going to name the area, it should be right up front. Uh, so I would, I would also support option three. Uh, does anybody want to make a motion at this point or other thoughts? <clears throat> I'd be happy to make a motion to adopt. Okay. Three. I would second Hal's motion. Okay. Let me call the roll here. Hal, you get to vote on your own motion. I, I approve it. <laughs> okay. Karen. Yes. Dave. Yes. Caroline. Yes. And Kurt votes yes. Leah, we are unanimous, unanimously in favor of option three. Thank you to the board and thank you to the staff. I also want to, uh, I want to take a trip back to the memory lane here just for a minute to a a meeting at the North Boulder Rec Center that was really, really big. Uh, Karen, that may have been one of your first meetings as a board member. Um, is that right? Were you just? No, maybe okay. So maybe that was I was just on that. Uh, had just been appointed. But, I was I was there, but I'd already been on the board a year. Okay. Um, anyway, I just want to give a shout out to Dan Burke who stepped in and took responsibility for things and allowed this process to move ahead, incorporate the public's concerns, but keep things going in a positive direction and give staff uh, the opportunity to uh, re-engage on these issues. And I think that really made it possible for us to get where we are. So um, kudos. I, I'd like to echo that and thank you very much, Dan. I, I do think uh, we, we've got to a good place. Oh, well, I, I appreciate that. And that provides me a great segue because before we left this, I just wanted to thank Casey, um, who, as, as you can imagine, uh, right after that meeting, approaching Casey and say, hey, we got a great job. We got a great project for you here. <laughs> and, um, and we really felt like she was um, uh, the one to take this on. And so she, she took a project that was basically tattered and torn and pieced it back together. So um, I, thanks for the kudos, but I just wanna pass those thanks right on to Casey who um, has, has really done a great job and, and really and to Allison Eklund um, mm -hmm. who provided a great segue to our community and has been helping to facilitate community conversations. Um, there's a lot of people to thank, but uh, uh, a couple of shout outs uh, to Casey and Allison in particular for sort of hopping in the fray with me. And, uh, and I think everybody will agree in community, including the community members that were sort of coming out the end uh, in a great spot. So thank you. Thank you, Casey. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. Bravo. Um, we're going to stick with Wonderland Lake uh, area for one minute because uh, as part of our e uh, monthly email sort of update on other things, open space, uh, we were thinking of including this item, but since we were going to be talking uh, Wonderland Lake anyway, I uh, just asked uh, John if he wouldn't mind just giving us a brief update on some 
uh, management actions that are going to be occurring in the area. We didn't want to confuse it with the ISP because it really is totally separate. Um, but since we're talking one of the lake, rather than putting in an email update, we thought John could provide you with a quick update here. Yeah, and um, thanks, Dan. And just quickly, board, uh, we wanted to inform you about some routine maintenance work that will occur on the Wonderland Lake Dam next week. And like Dan said, this is not part of the ISP, the case he was just discussing, but Open Space, um, Open Space Mountain Parks crews plan to remove four uh, non-native crack willow trees that are downslope of the Wonderland Lake Dam starting next Monday. If the weather cooperates and if our wildlife impact assessment is favorable. Uh, this is sort of part of routine maintenance for small earthen dams uh, to prevent trees from rooting into them, which can weaken the stability of the dam over time. And um, the state dam safety engineer has identified these trees at the toe of the Wonderland Lake Dam um, as requiring removal to meet uh, state dam safety requirements. So there'll be crews out there and they'll be uh, cutting and chipping each tree on site. Uh, so you'll hear chainsaws and a chipper, but they should be finished by uh, before the end of next week. And just wanted the board and the community to know that uh, there will be ongoing work for dam safety that people may see equipment and staff out on the site from time to time. Go ahead, Karen. You'll, have, have, you'll have some of those wonderful sandwich signs out there, right? So that they know why you're cutting down trees. <laughs> yes, Karen. Um, uh, uh, we, we will have the sandwich signs as well as staff prepared to speak with anyone that has concerns. So. Great. Thank you. I thought you'd be hauling them up the dam face, John, to put them in the lake. What's wrong with that? <laughs> oh. <laughs> we'll see, Dave. Probably yeah. not. <laughs> Let me know. Okay. Uh, thank you, John. And Dan, uh, do we want to take a five-minute break? It's 8.15 before we start you on matters from the department. Sure. Uh, okay. To you, Chair. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we will be in recess to 8.20. Five minutes. Hal, I love your hat. Thank you, Karen. I appreciate it. It's my dad's. I was assuming that. It, it, it just looks so New England.
Steve, are you still there? Yes, I am. If you put crack willow logs into the water, do they sprout? Ooh, good question. As a willow, yeah. I think they may have that potential to do so, but we can check with John when he comes back on. But I wonder, the the ISP talks about putting logs when you cut down trees, putting oh. them into the lake. And I, <clears throat> the answer was clearly not. And I was assuming because <laughs> they sprouted. Yeah, and probably when you're inundating them underneath kind of the depths that they normally get submerged to in, in the lake, <laughs> that's not an issue. It's usually- Oh, well, well, that's great. <laughs> I'm sorry, we, uh, we've been joined by Mr. Holmes here. <laughs> <laughs> I love my, it. My dad's office is truly a piece of classic work. Wow. Fabulous. And you, have to, you have to exert certain behaviors when you go in there. It's Fabulous. clear. You, you know, they told him his lungs looked perfect on his last cat skin, and so he doubled down and bought all this pipe tobacco. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't take the advice, keep doing what you're doing, right? <laughs> wow. It's, I'll tell you, it's tough. He did, he's the guy who showed me nature. I'm, I'm, it's, a, this is an interesting one. Yeah. Well, it's great. None of that was lost. Yeah. And I, I'm really glad to be here with you all. He appreciated well, I'm glad you are too. Yeah, was thank a, you. <clears throat> okay. I think we are back uh, now. And uh, Dan, uh, you, uh, you've got it. Yeah, we're moving into the matters from the department. We've got one item and then a couple of verbal updates um, after we're done, but I'm gonna turn things over to uh, Deputy Director Steve Armstead, who will introduce the uh, next subject matter and our presenter uh, and voice and site monitoring results is the subject matter. So Steve. Right, thanks Dad and Dan. And I just wanted to say a few things before we get in actually to the presentation and opportunity for you know, to, to discuss the results from our latest round of voice and sight tag monitoring. <laughs> just to, again, just set some context around the overall topic that we're gonna be venturing into over the coming months. And just knowing that this topic is pretty, pretty loaded, you know, it, and certainly when we've engaged in conversation in the past, it brings up a lot of ideas and questions. Um, but the reality too is we have a long history with this program. We have a long history with voice and sight. It's been part of our system for decades. And it, because of that, it actually also gives us a history of adaptive management around it because we have lived with it for a while. We're also constantly looking at it in terms of how does this opportunity afford the desired experience that dog guardians are seeking and how does that experience fit within our system and how can we be successful over time? So some of that adaptive management you know, started, you know, probably most significantly in the mid nineties when we realized that there needed to be clarification in the city code about what the expectations of a dog's behavior and a guardian's control abilities needed to be kind of integrated in. So there's clarity for the rangers when they enforced it and clarity for visitors when they came in and wanted to know how do I meet the terms of voice and sight control. So that was kind of our first kind of evolution in what voice and sight control was. They had another big kind of shift and change with the adoption of the visitor master plan. And at that point, the implementation of the voice and sight tag program. And so, you know, again, kind of an adaptive step. And one of the, I think, helpful things that came forth out of the visitor master plan was the recognition that we had to really make sure we aligned monitoring is one of our inputs into our adaptive decision making. And so we did, kind of assign and have aligned monitoring went along with the program. And that led to yet another kind of adaptive step with the program back in 2012, 13, and kind of some finalization of decisions, and changes in the program in 14 that went live in 2015, um, that again was accompanied by another round of monitoring, which is some of the results we'll hear tonight. So. I think it's just good to keep in mind, we do have a long history. There's a long um, road of work and probably work ahead of us as we continue to think about this program and make sure we're making adjustments to it that make, help it meet the goals of the program and be a good sustainable complement to our system. 
So to get into this conversation, you know, we've got kind of a series of rolling out information to the board because it's a complex program. It has a lot of different facets and we've kind of already staged some of the information and we'll be talking in the coming months about more. Um, our first step into it was just uh, notification in the board back in August about the fact that we would be t covering this topic through a series of rolling out information. And then last month we shared with you some information update about just the, uh, the registration process and the fact that with the COVID implications, we've had the voice insight class be, um, being offered online. And then we also gave you the first touch of the voice insight monitoring information, knowing that it's a lot to take in and that kind of that would lead into tonight's conversation to hear about those results and offer an opportunity to discuss those results. That'll then lead us into next month where again, staff will provide a lot of other information about the program, giving you information around um, the Ranger experience enforcement, the administration of the program, what we've been learning, how we've been moving forward with the educational aspects of the program, including the class, the financial aspects of the program. We know we also have a lot of survey information we've collected over time. So we wanna to try to be able to provide that information. So that's some information we'll share out in written format in November, following up in December with an opportunity for staff to present some of the highlights of that information and engage with the board again with an opportunity for questions <laughs> and dialogue around that. And the real goal here for then is for us to be able to have a foundation of information that we can go into, and I think ideally the latter part of the first quarter of next year, to actually really engage then in the conversation of, well, now with this information, where does that gonna lead? Where do we need to now focus our efforts around the program? And so, you know, we really do wanna spend the time to build the information base, but we do have some work ahead about discussing what's next. And I think as we talk about that, what, what's next, I do wanna be clear that one of the things staff will be thinking about, we'll hear ideas even just as we talk about stuff, but when we get into that um, conversation, it's going to be very important for us to be thinking about what are those actions that we can take that are already consistent with policy guidance or within plan guidance. And those may be some things we can more adaptively take action on in a more immediate time frame. And also kind of be tracking if there are other ideas that are starting to percolate that may require a review of policy or maybe even a change of policy that we may also have to start keeping in mind that that would may require us to look at, well, what's the process involved? with reviewing or assessing a policy change. And that may, may also actually need us to check in with council to clarify that they're comfortable with us going down a policy change. So I'm just setting the stage that we'll be tracking kind of the ideas <coughs> of forward and, and being able to make sure we know that some things may be already clear policy and we'll have an easier gateway to go through and maybe make some, some changes. Others may take even more thought and time to figure out the right process steps. So, um, but all that said, I think what kind of the tonight's really kind of going to help with, with help us with is to share at least the foundation of monitoring information that we've been working on collecting. Um, but in saying that too, I think it's really important to keep an open mind to what we hear from the monitoring results because I I think as we as individuals oftentimes see results maybe cast as monitoring and it's doesn't align with what our own perceptions or experiences mm -hmm. are in the system. It may not align or it may align with what we like or dislike about the program. But the benefit of the monitoring results is to provide at least a subset of objective information that uh, with all the other information we'll be presenting and talking about gives us an ability to reflect about the program and help us maybe find where there's areas we think, oh, this is a good area to pay attention to and maybe an area to focus on for maybe some adaptive changes too. Um, and be thoughtful about the amount of effort it's gonna take and is that worth that effort as well? Will the results get us the, the right outcome? So by talking about monitoring, we're not trying to invalidate the experiences people have, good, bad in our system, but it does at least give us an objective set of information that we can also rely upon in our decision making. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Colin Leslie, one of our Human Dimensions coordinators, who's our lead on the um, voice and sight monitoring, and he'll walk us through the results that we've been able to compile over the last couple of years of monitoring. So with that, Colin, the floor is yours. Okay. 
Oh, you, does he, you, need, you need your mic off or turned on? Allison, I don't know if you're seeing Colin needs to be unmuted. Okay, try now, Colin. Okay, all right. Sorry, you must have gotten off and back on. Yeah, it's uh, got off for a few there. Um, great, so before I, before I pop up the presentation, um, it's been a while since I've been to, been to a board meeting, since before they were virtual. So um, for those who don't know me, Colin Leslie, I work uh, with our Human Dimensions program I started with OSMP in 20, I'm losing track now. Um, it's been about five years. So I inherited the uh, management of this monitoring program for its second and third cycles. And tonight, this is sort of gonna be a wrap up of everything that we have collected and generally learned over, over the last six years, which involved three rounds of, of monitoring. So these were conducted every two years, 2014, 2016, 2018. And to just give you a, a sense of how this, I'm gonna flow this presentation tonight, I'm gonna to do a very, very brief overview and review of the Voice and Sight program and really the two large monitoring components we had both before and after the TAG program enhancements were enacted. A little bit about what the monitoring program is itself and sort of the foundations for the monitoring program. And then we can go ahead and, and dive into the actual report itself, which I know has been shared with all of you, but quick overview of sort of how we did the work, the methods, um, some of the high level results, far too many to include in, in a 15 minute, 20 minute presentation. And then some of our research recommendations, as Steve said, alluded to, not yet into policy recommendations because that's part of a larger discussion, but more specifically what we have learned in actually implementing the monitoring and some of the takeaways from that. And then we can, uh, course wrap it up with some time for some discussion and questions. So as a little overview of the TAG program, if we start with the visitor master plan in 2005, which is by no means the start of voice and sight as a management um, regulation or opportunity on open space lands, there were sort of three cycles of monitoring, 2006, 2007, and 2010. And ultimately, and that was, that was with the launch of the TAG program. So actually requiring, uh, in this case, people to, um, to get some information about the Voice and Sight TAG program and then buy a TAG. Around 2011, there was a request from city council to assess the TAG program that eventually led into some TAG program revisions. And the big thing that I want to uh, want to recap here is that that was a pretty hefty engagement process that lasted quite a long time. And that included a lot of staff and external subject matter expert review of the program, um, pretty extensive public process, a lot of input from the Open Space Board of Trustees, and then ultimately City Council approval for the TAG program enhancements themselves. Um, there was also a pretty big review process towards the end of that period for how the monitoring program itself was designed. Um, that particular piece didn't really go through City Council approval process, but it went through the three other major components. And that's, that's really what led us to both the program design and the monitoring design that we have implemented over the last six years. Since then, like I said, we've done monitoring in 2014, 2016, and 2018. And it might not be super apparent on that timeline, but each one of those time periods got a little bit longer as we were able to invest more resources in upping our sampling effort. And what the program was, what the monitoring or sorry, the TAG program goals, which were similar uh, to the original Voice and Sight TAG program goals, but these are what were part of the enhancement, were to increase the proportion of dog guardians 
who had control over their dogs by, by the applicable regulations. There was a visitor experience component to it. And then there was also a natural resource uh, conservation component. And the monitoring measures touched on all three of these, but really what they focused on was evaluating these through the standpoint of direct interactions between uh, guardians or, or visitor groups with dogs and other things. That could be other visitor groups, wildlife, um, other, re other specific resources. And so it was really about those direct interactions. This wasn't to sort of do a, a comprehensive resource assessment. Um, it didn't have a survey component. It was really focused on what's sort of, what's transpiring when opportunities arise and uh, dogs have an opportunity to interact with something. One of the biggest changes from the 2006 to 2010 monitoring and the most recent set of monitoring was a revision to really focus on the regulatory foundations for the Voice and Sight program, as well as other dog management regulations within the Boulder Revised Code. 2006 to 2010 did include some components of sort of courtesy etiquette, things which might relate to, to conflict. Um, that was that was a criticism of the first monitoring period and something that was pretty heavily revised in the second. So this everything that we evaluated in this monitoring program was essentially tied back to a regulatory uh, to a regulation. So things like charging and chasing and otherwise displaying aggressive behavior, those could be towards people. Um, towards other dogs, towards wildlife and livestock. And then there was the, the recall component, which is part of the voice and sight, which is the ability of a guardian to, to stop their dog from doing something or to recall it back to them. And so those really form the foundations of all the definitions that we use for our observational coding in this. Um, and if anybody wants to see that, I have, I have a slide at the very end I can show, but those were also in the report that sort of each one of those behaviors were, were defined and related to one of these codes. All right, so jumping into some of the monitoring itself, uh, the measures that we focused on were visible voice and sight tag display and compliance with carrying a leash on your person for voice and sight trails. That was only done in 2014. It had pretty high rates of compliance. Um, and we thought we could better invest those resources in trying to observe some of the other measures. And those first two, the thing I wanna point out about those is that's really administrative compliance, right? That's not a skills-based compliance. That's going through the class, meeting all the requirements of the Voice and Sight program, purchasing the tag, renewing it each year. Um, so that's, that's an administrative compliance. The rest of these are more in skills-based compliance. They, they rely on the guardian either paying attention or a certain level of training with the dog. So keeping dogs within sight, um, off-leash dogs being under voice and sight control, um, that was further defined as, as responding to recall commands, which was pretty narrowly defined as, as sort of either needing to include come or here, and that was that was done to uh, to sort of filter out potential other words that that guardians might use to to simply talk to their dogs. No charging or chasing or otherwise displaying aggression. Um, so we sort of had a had an aggregated definition of what aggression aggression might be. There were certain sort of key key features we were looking for and that was developed through a lot of um, a lot of review with both dog trainers and other doggy and sort of the dog ethology literature which is which is the dog behavior literature no charging or chasing wildlife and livestock um, not having more than two dogs per off leash or two off leash dogs per guardian then not so directly related to voice and sight but um, something that we were able to implement as part of just general dog management, right? The other trails were, of course, that aren't voice and sight where dogs are allowed are leash required trails. And we have some 
some voice and sight trails that seasonally become leash and leash required trails. So we had a method to assess proportions of dogs that were on and off leash and whether and what the composition of a tag display was for those. And then in 2018, we also replicated that method of, of on leash, off leash and tag, no tag on voice and sight trails. So not that component didn't look at the behavioral part, which was, which was another method that we were using on voice and sight trails, but we wanted to get sort of a complete picture of all dogs on voice and sight trails, not just those that were off leash. So the methods that we used, we had a little over 80 defined observation zones. These were all documented in the field. They're digitized in GIS. And they, what they are is they're continuous fields of view where a visitor group entering one point onto the system can, can traverse through this, um, this section of trail through which they can potentially have opportunities to interact with other visitor groups, wildlife, livestock, depending on the areas, or issue commands back and forth um, or to their dogs so that we were able to assess uh, the outcomes of these, of these events. We, we provided all of our field technicians with these field maps. So, um, on a on a site by site basis and across all three monitoring cycles, everything was conducted over the same um, the same area and the same distance. The leash status monitoring was pretty similar. If you look at that purple dot down on the on the bottom portion of that map, and you just imagine a line extending straight across that trail, um, that was conducted as a as a line transect. Try and transect a visitor group would walk across it. And we would record visitor attributes such as uh, number of people in the group, the activity, the uh, apparent activity of the group, how many dogs were on leash, how many dogs were off leash, and then associated tag status for um, for each of those categories. Our study area was pretty expansive across the system. Um, we had 81 voice and sight locations, 32 permanent leash locations, and then eight seasonal leash sites. These were limited by about a 60 minute hiking distance from the trail that was done for two reasons. One, visitation generally tends to taper off, of course, the further in you go. And also just for uh, sampling efficiency of not having to have technicians spend too long simply getting to a monitoring site. And this map in the, in the web-based version is, is interactive. You can zoom in, click on a point, and it will pop up and tell you how many uh, observations were made across all three years at that location. So before I get into some of the compliance measures, just wanted to highlight that we do pay attention to our sample composition. We wanna know both who we're, who we're capturing in this um, and certainly how that compares to our visitation data, as well as making sure that we're randomizing across uh, times of the day. There are other ways we can look at this, making sure we're randomizing across all the months that we're doing it so that we're not, we're not getting an, a, a biased sample in, in time or space to any particular location of the system. So the graph on the left there, it's really just there to say, you know, we sampled all basically all daylight hours of the day um, from sun up to sundown. And in terms of activity type, the vast majority of, of the visitor groups observed were hikers, runners were the second most, uh, most frequent group. And then bikers fall off a little bit more. They're less, uh, they're lower in proportion than what we see in general in that likely just has to do with the, the general difficulty of, of biking with a dog. Although some people obviously uh, can and do do it. So there are a lot of results. There's a lot more detail in the report itself, but some of the things that I wanted to highlight from the voice and sight observations, tag compliance has increased over the years to about 82%, and that's the administrative requirement of displaying the tag. So it's, it's definitely an increase, 82% um, as a ratio. You know, that means that it's about four and five groups that, that have the, 
the tag uh, properly displayed. Non-compliant behavior outcomes are infrequent when they do uh, when they do occur. So, what we know is that when when we're observing visitor groups, a little a little over half of the visitor groups that we observed actually had an opportunity to interact with something while they were being observed. Those, those opportunities can lead to either what we call passes, which means none of the behaviors we were interested in were displayed by either group uh, during the interaction, or it can lead, um, or sorry, during the opportunity, or it can lead to an interaction, which means at least one of the behaviors was displayed either by the dog we we're observing or the other visitor party, um, or a command was issued. So non-compliant behavior outcomes were pretty infrequent and a non-compliant behavioral outcome would be, uh, for example, aggressive display towards the other visitor party or um, charging and chasing wildlife. Voice recall uh, is a little lower, a little under 80%. So one of the caveats with voice recall is we can only assess its success when a recall command is issued to the dog. So that's a slight, that's a sort of a subset of, of the overall um, sample size that we, that we observed. And, and those sample sizes are available in the report. They're still large enough that we can feel pretty confident about this voice recall percentage. The last thing that I want to point out is that wildlife is, is very rarely conspicuous at, at most of our locations. And what I mean by this is, is not that wildlife is necessarily not present, but certainly large wildlife like deer are generally, um, generally absent at most of our locations during most of the observation times. Um, things like like birds and small mammals, while also present, generally aren't within the proximity of, uh, of the trail. We had flush distances, um, which were all based on the scientific literature, so that if, if, a bird, if a bird did flush while a visitor party was walking by, we would know whether or not to attribute that to the dog, to the visitor group's presence and, the, and potentially the dog's presence or not. The leash status is the other major component that we look at. Uh, the key findings from here is that leash overall compliance with uh, having dogs on leash, on leash required trails has been relatively consistent about 80%. 80% is generally within the realm of um, what peer agencies like Boulder County also see in general across their, their properties. Seasonal leash compliance is, is lower at around 60%. And so these are trails that are voice in sight during a portion of the year, but become seasonally leash required during other times of the year. There's one trail that becomes leash required because of grassland nesting birds. Um, and there are, are seven trails that become leash required for fall bear foraging, or at least that's the, that was the original purpose that they were um, seasonally leash required. Because we replicated this on voice and sight trails in 2018, we were able to get a more complete picture of sort of what overall compliance is with having dogs on leash, if they don't have a voice and sight tag, um, if they're off leash, whether or not they're properly displaying the tag. And what we're seeing is that compliance is about 9% <laughs> on average across voice and sight trails. Um, this also helped answer a couple of questions that we had just previously never, never really had a sense of what the answer might be. And that's that about 40% of dogs on voice and sight trails are in fact on leash at any given time. And, of, and, and about 17% of those of the dogs on voice and sight trails are on leash and have a voice and sight tag. Um, so there definitely are voice and sight uh, program participants that do choose to keep their dogs on leash, at least from time to time on voice and sight trails. Uh, the last thing I'll point out is that, that that plot up on the right there, that's just to show that while we didn't, we didn't, this was a randomized sample and we didn't necessarily get large sample sizes for individual, a lot of individual sites. I did look at any location where we had at least 
10 observations or 10 visitor groups observed for that location. And of course, there's a range of compliance depending on what on what trail you are. So you're on. So within each category, uh, compliance definitely definitely varies a little bit from location to location, although we don't have large enough sample sizes to compare every location um, together. Now, I know there, there have been some questions that have come up on adaptive management. Um, we, this term sort of gets applied in two different ways. So I wanted to touch on this because the 2005 visitor master plan did did have some proposed standards in it um, as far as compliance with with dog control and excrement removal requirements um, that's how it was stated from a sort of formal capital a adaptive management standpoint one of the challenges with that is that it's a composite standard and so it didn't identify specific measures to evaluate um, one of the things that we certainly hope these results and future information will will uh, or discussion that this might spur is that not all dog control measures may be of equal concern or consequence. Um, there wasn't a sort of prioritization laid out in the visitor master plan. And so really what that leads to is that currently we don't have sort of a, a, a suite of if then statements. You know, if, if we measure some, this, some particular measure and it comes out at a certain level, then what do we do? Um, so there aren't those, those predefined feedback loops, although there may be opportunities for those. The opportunity that we really see here is that we really think we now have a very robust or system-wide uh, assessment of conditions. Yes, there are some locations where wildlife encounters might be more frequent or compliance might be lower, but in terms of, of the large number of miles of trails that we, that we manage, these results sort of give us a generalized uh, assessment of what goes on on a day-to-day -day basis. And then some of the discussion that we, that we certainly hope to spur is, you know, what are, what are those systemic issues versus those localized issues? Because those will have different management interventions or, or potential management interventions to address them. Um, what is some prioritization of measures or, or the certain different aspects of dog management? Because associated with that is this question of cost benefit um, for both management interventions and monitoring. Across all three years, we've conducted a little over 2,000 hours combined observation time in the field. Um, depending on the year and the scale of our program, that equates to, you know, two to three technicians, which could be upwards of 50, uh, 40 percent of our of our program capacity. So this type of monitoring is is resource intensive, um, although at this at this time, there's really sort of no alternative to get a lot of this this field observation information. And so that really sort of leads us into our future research recommendations. Again, not, not immediately into the policy realm, but if we were to sort of pair this monitoring with management interventions in the future, what are some things that we, we should be thinking about? And that's that as it's currently operationalized, the, the behavioral component is not optimized for detecting any specific behavior, right? It tried to capture a pretty large suite of behaviors. The leash status observation, understanding how the proportion of dogs that are on and off leash and how many have a tag and don't have a tag is a bit more efficient um, just from the number of visitor groups that we can observe over a period of time when we're out. And that as we think about potential uh, management actions that we may wanna take in the future, what, are the, what is the very specific issue or issues that we think we can address? And the more, the more targeted those management interventions are, can be, um, we can better think about and estimate the effect size, which is sort of what's, what's the change that we are thinking we can even get by a particular management intervention, because that really plays into how much monitoring needs to be done in order to verify whether or not that change actually took place. 
And then again, it's just, it's back to that cost benefit. And the closer we sort of approach that, that higher percentage uh, compliance within any particular measure, you know, generally the higher the cost it's gonna be to move that, move that needle. Um, so things that tend to fall on the lower end or a little bit more in the middle, you know, those may be the ones that, that are more prime for, for thinking about management interventions. Uh, I'll go over this super quick. Just as a reminder, we do have more information coming in the future. Um, the monitoring report is certainly not the entirety of the Voice Insight program or what we know about the Voice Insight program, but it is, it is really sort of the most comprehensive assessment we have of these direct interactions that occur in the field. And with that, I will end it and open it up for any discussions or questions. Allison, can we go back to the uh, matrix view here? Yep, if Colin just unshares his screen. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, matrix of. Oh, sorry. No, I'm sorry. So we can see. Man, Hollywood. Board ah. <laughs> there we go. Colin, thanks. It's a it's a very interesting report, and I give big points to anybody that uses statistical power analysis. So, way to go. Um, okay, uh, who's got the first questions for Colin? Dave. So Colin, thanks for that. I, I think, you know, your, uh, your discussion of the standard and kind of the ambiguity uh, around standards. Um, I think the expectation initially early on was that exactly what you're doing so that in fact, the monitoring would start informing you know, what the standards needed to be. So I think uh, it's, it's probably taken longer than any of us expected, but uh, certainly uh, it's going in the right direction. And so good for you and good for everyone that's working on it. That I think is really important. Thank you. Um, I'll throw in a question. Um, uh, and I, I'm sure you're thinking about this all the time, but it just, it, the impression I have is that you probably have more monitoring sites than you're getting payoff from, uh, given that it dilutes, you know, the, the power of examining any individual site. And I, I just assume that you're considering whether you should be consolidating your observations in significantly fewer sites still having, you know, types of locations, but not maybe as many in order to get a bigger bang out of your observational buck. What, uh, what's your thinking? Yeah, we do, we do have a pretty large number of sites. I think a lot of that is reflection of the fact that there was a lot of uncertainty, even in the second round of monitoring as to, as to how widely distributed some of these um, behaviors of interest were both in, in space and time. Right. And um, how variable and how variable they are. So it, there is there is some more opportunity we can we can do to go back and look at uh, look at the sample as a whole. Um, we do know that there are some locations which consistently across years we had very few observations at. Right. Yeah. Of course that that we do have more observations. Um, because there are sort of so many measures. Uh, the question of variability also comes down somewhat to measures. There are certain sites right. where we have may have a lot of interactions or opportunities for interactions, um, but the majority of them are are sort of passes. Um, where there may be other locations which have slightly fewer opportunities, but those do result in more interactions. Not necessarily non-compliant outcomes, but just more interactions. So, sort of, again, there's some potential refinement there as we start discussions about which measures, you know, we may want to uh, think about going forward. Right, thanks. Okay, Karen, did you have your hand up? Yeah, um, just, an, just an observation, Colin. Over the last 30, 40 years, 
the places where we used to have large population of deers, of, of large deer populations have um, vanished because of dog use. And, and so I'm not surprised to hear you say you don't see wildlife interaction. Um, my question is, uh, when you, I read the full report, and when you described within sight, my understanding of what you wrote is that it was within sight when it was ahead of the person. But there are a lot of dogs that go off trail and around to the side and behind the person. And my sense was that you didn't, you didn't capture that. Is that correct? At least that's the way I read your full report. So with insight, um, and I can go back and check it, but it was defined as being within a 360 degree view. So not, not that the guardian was, was looking directly or immediately at the dog, but basically if they turned around in a circle, would they be able to to see the dog? So was it not obscured by vegetation or topography or something like that? Okay, so it measured whether it would have been possible for the guardian to have actually seen the dog, not if they were seeing the dog. Correct. Okay, so Colin, uh, we're, we're still kind of wallowing around in prairie dogs, uh, even if we're not talking about them specifically tonight. But my question is, um, it, it strikes me and what I've seen kind of out on the ground is that it, when the trails are in or through prairie dog towns or prairie dogs are occupied along the trail, uh, that that's probably the highest wildlife interaction um, possibility that that's really out there. And so, my question is: um, Do you have a notion of how many trails kind of had were in prairie dog towns, or you know, kind of had prairie dogs as the uh, associated wildlife? If I'm remembering correctly, it was it was only two or three. Um, but two is what actually comes to mind. Both uh, two locations that met all the rest of the criteria and then happened to also overlap with prairie dog colonies. Right. Well, I think uh, just from experience, uh, dogs are, are usually attracted to prairie dogs. And yeah. so uh, if there's an opportunity for misbehavior, um, that's definitely a prominent one. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts or comments? It's, the board's gotten fairly quiet here. It's not clear to me what our discussion tonight is supposed to be about. Steve defined the things that it was not about. And I'm not sure where the boundaries are that we are supposed to be going tonight. Steve. Well, let me just say, Karen, I think this is really an opportunity to understand with Colin, because he's, he's probably the best person to really interpret or help us understand what we've learned from the monitoring. So really, that is, that's the goal. And so I think if there's questions or to make sure we have the understanding of how that information was obtained and what we might understand from the information, here's a chance to really dive, dive into it. Won't be our last chance by any means, but certainly it's kind of this, this moment to focus on this aspect of the program. Well, uh, I'd like to hear more then about the seasonal leash observations. Sure. Um, you so said only one of <laughs> only one site was grassland nesting bird site seasonal. Correct. So we we have we have some other area closures, but there is only one trail itself which actually changes designation. Um, 
Greenbelt Plateau. So uh, Dowdy Draw, there is also an area closure uh, yeah. adjacent to that trail on one side, the trail itself remains voice in sight. Um, the other the other locations were originally created as as seasonal leash closures for uh, fall bear foraging. Um, there are some some questions as to whether or not those are still the most appropriate sites for um, for bear foraging. Um, that being said, they do switch to that seasonal leash um, requirement and. Because each sample was was randomized, we we don't have a a good site to site comparison to see whether or not <laughs> compliance itself really changes, or if or if those seasonal leash sites are sort of always operating in that sixty percent um, arena overall. Um, but that that result, even though uh, twenty fourteen was was actually just Greenbelt Plateau. Um, because the monitoring was conducted early in the year, 2016 <laughs> only captured the the fall uh, seasonal closures. 2018 captured mm -hmm. both. Um, despite that, the the percentages were sort of all in that same 60% um, ballpark overall. Caroline, you had a, your hand up. You're muted. I think I'm not now. Yeah, thank you, Colin, for that presentation. That was really good. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, I think they kind of tie in together. Um, do you ever receive feedback from the participants of the mm -hmm. site program? Um, and if you do, is that typically via email or you know, how are you guys communicating with each other? And then um, I, I didn't know if anyone had ever discussed um, self-reporting or self-regulating. Um, so maybe drawing up a sample and sending out an email saying, you know, hey, this week when you walk your dog, um, you know, can you report back on A, B, and C? Um, I don't know if either of those things have ever happened. Um, so with the second one, I'm not I'm not aware of anything that's ever been um, been implemented like that. To your first question, there is a there is an ongoing survey which has been live since the since the voice and sight class was enacted as a requirement. Um, we have not run statistics on that on that survey uh, feedback super recently, um, but it's something that we do look at from from time to time. Um, I need to touch base with couple of my coworkers on that because I haven't accessed it directly, but we do have that. And it's a, it's a survey that goes out to every voice and sight class participant. Yeah. I was just wondering if there um, was a forum or if anyone had ever thought of having a, a forum where um, the voice and sight participants can discuss things with each other that they're seeing on the trail. They can talk about particular trails um, and maybe it's an option to, to kind of self-regulate. Mm -hmm. So similarly, um, often when we have management questions, one of the things we do, and this is sort of taking off of where Carolyn was going, I think, um, is we talk to the people that are on the trails and we ask them, are you aware of this? Are you aware of that? Um, to try to get some sense of what the issues are leading to their behavior or potentially where, what areas of investment would be most useful to try to improve compliance and things like that. So I know you're trying to bring a lot of different data to bear on this whole issue. Um, how does that type of data get into this? Does it come from visitor surveys or is it more from ranger interactions or what? Probably depends a little bit on the topic and a little bit on the location. Um, a lot of our questions on surveys over the last few years have generally focused on sort of the quality of interactions between visitor groups. Um, so the on-site survey includes questions uh, ranging from a you know, conflictive experience um, to a positive experience, and that's across all different potential activity types that people encountered on that day. 
Um, both the resident survey and the master plan survey have asked questions about potential dog management issues. Um, we're currently right. sort of compiling a summary that'll that'll be forthcoming on on some of those some of those data sets. Um, there are some considerations in sort of how to interpret that. In the past, we have conducted um, attitudinal surveys to on about dog management and the mm. that available on the on the reports page on the OSBT website. And that was a topical survey specifically about uh, dogs. Interesting. And Kurt, I may just add too, you actually were in that course, you kind of offered a potential thing we may want to think about come, you know, Q1 and what do we do now? Because we've right. not really, to my knowledge, sent out a survey to the participants in the program over some time just to ask some questions directly to them and use mm -hmm. that. Maybe that's with our choices of where do we focus our efforts, something we think would be meaningful or be a way to gain information. So yeah. if we haven't done that, that could be one of these actions we choose to go down the path. So we'll make note of that. And certainly we can revisit that when we say, okay, where do we need to focus our time and attention? Sure. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Dave. Uh, Colin, uh, you know, I think one of the things that is, is of great interest to the board is, is trends. Um, and I guess my, my question is your sense of, you know, kind of generally the factors that, are, you know, you're looking at in the monitoring, kind of what's the trend direction generally and uh, the exam, are, are there some specific um, factors that you think uh, needed to be need to be more focused on and I'm thinking you know, obviously seasonal leash um, is one but are there some others that you think uh, we need to be paying uh, particular attention to as well yeah so I think the things that that probably stand out to me is that even though tag display is at is at 82%. That's the one that has most notably increased over time. That's also the one that's sort of most, that's that's easiest for us to affect um, simply by getting people to participate in the program. The the rest of the behaviors, right, have have quite a quite a range in terms of both the frequency that they occur, um, but also a fair number of them are 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 somewhat sort of stable across time. So um, within a certain margin of error, you know, there hasn't been a big change in in sort of overall leash compliance, both on permanent or seasonal trails. And so, um, you know, it doesn't doesn't leave us with necessarily a whole lot of explanation of of the why, but it 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 does sort of suggest that that's, that's the percent compliance that we're really probably working with uh, since it's almost been validated over three cycles. Okay. Uh, Caroline? Yeah, um, you guys all might know this, uh, but I, I don't. Is there a uh, increase yearly in new uh, applicants for the voice insight? Like, is there a 5% increase every year? Or does it stay pretty constant? Well, uh, I'll just answer that as that's the type of, inf we'll share that in November and start talking about the levels of participation. So that's information that we'll roll out later, Caroline. So great question. That's, we'll, we'll prepare that type of information for you. Perfect, yeah. And then just along with that for, for that discussion, um, the, the renewal rate, if, if we find that the applicants are, are renewing every year, if that's staying constant as well. Okay, we'll see what we can kind of pull out of the registration data and be able to share that, yep. Karen. Uh, Colin, the excrement pickup and removal, that's one of the things that we all observe while we're out on trails is poop bags. Um, talk a little bit more about whether there was any variation from, we, we all went in I don't know, 20, 30 years ago with the assumption that that leash trails would have better compliance with poop bags than voice and sight just because the dog was within reach on a leash. Is there any validity to that based on your data or 
What did you really learn about excrement pickup and removal from your observations? So for this monitoring program, the excrement pickup and removal of which both had to occur to be compliant with that measure mm -hmm. um, was, was easy to add on to the, to the behavioral component of the observational monitoring. Those, the, our, the compliance rates that we've seen for that are generally in the same realm of the, um, the pet waste pickup study, uh, funded research study that we contracted a couple of years back which did stratify across uh, leash required and off, off leash trails. And for the, for the handful of sites that were included in that, there, there was a difference. Um, I'm remembering right about an 11% difference between uh, on leash and off leash uh, compliance with pickup removal. I'd have to, I'd have to open up that report to validate that, but I do know that there was a difference uh, with, with on leash being slightly higher compliance. And um, with your observations with this monitoring study, anything noteworthy? Really just that, that the percent compliance that we observed on voice and site trails when we had the opportunity to observe it was uh, right about in line with, with what we observed during that funded research study. So poorer compliance on voice and site trails than on leash trails, is that the correct? Yeah, about 11% about lower on average. There are, you know, with that there are you start getting too many variables in the mix. It's hard to control for all of them, but there are questions about infrastructure availability, um, consistency of some of that infrastructure across the system, both for having bags available and disposing of them. Mm -hmm. so there are there are multiple components that can be looked at with the with some of those with that issue in particular too. Yeah. Okay. Well, Colin, thank you. And I know we're going to be seeing you again soon. And uh, Steve, I appreciate the, uh, the sort of the overview of where we are and where we're going. Uh, I think that gives a good sense of sort of the stages that we're going to go through. And I'm, I know we'll continue to get some questions from the public, you know, relating to uh, what should we be watching for next. But I thought that was very helpful. Right, and we've got uh, Lisa Gonzalo's kind of our project lead throughout just the conversation around voice and sight. And so she's making sure we'll, we'll share and connect in with our stakeholders and having information available on our website so people know kind of the path ahead. Great. Um, All right. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Colin. Yeah, just a reminder for anyone listening or if you tuned in late, so November board packet will be written information to set up actual conversation for December. So uh, written, a lot more written information on Voice and Sight uh, uh, program in, in November, and then a scheduled dis, uh, December discussion under matters from the department. And then of course, we'll start to daylight what looks, what quarter one looks like for uh, uh, more board conversations. So, just to reiterate what Steve said in the beginning in case anybody joined us late. Dan, before we go on, um, mm -hmm. this memo from our September 9th packet about what sounds to me like lots of problems uh, during COVID with how to deal with dog tags. Um, I, can you say anything about that? Is that something that's gonna change in 2021 or? you're just kind of waiting till the COVID mess is over or uh, tell us a little bit about what you're seeing happen with that. Well, I, I think I'll turn it over to Steve since he's sort of, uh, uh, I tapped Steve to be everything dogs. <laughs> uh, uh, Dog question. I, I think I can answer it, but I'm gonna have Steve do it because I know he'll answer it totally correctly. You know, in my first words to Dan was, oh, thank you, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I do 
do appreciate the, actually the opportunity. And K Karen, I think uh, there's a couple different aspects. One is for now and for the as long as we can see until things really change around COVID is the education class will continue to be online. And so that has actually been relatively smooth, smooth yet that still may not be um, you know, the, the best for people who, for whatever reason, an online learning opportunity just doesn't work for them. And we just don't have another way around that at this time. <clears throat> um, the other aspect, of course, is that with COVID, we don't have the ability for staff to come or the community to come to our Cherryville or excuse me, our hub to get, you know, questions answered or certainly when we start renewing to have any assistance um, through that process, it will be online. You know, at this point, we may, if there's any way to figure out another route, we may see what is possible, but it's probably unlikely, you know, we're going to be moving away from really the primary way of being online to register. So that'll be the real importance. But we've been shifting that way anyway over the last couple of years. So I think there's a certain level of, you know, kind of built in buy in to that. But having said that, too, is we did have some challenges last year with the, um, service the company that serviced the online provisions that you know anything voice and sight is pretty complex their normal rhythm is around dog licensing and voice and sight has enough nuances to it that um their the way it was configured didn't work as smoothly as we would have hoped and so we're working hard with them and hopefully we'll get that um rectified for this year but it's still a wait and see and so we'll see how that goes so, so it's certainly you know there may be some work ahead yet if it doesn't go smoothly that may be one of these areas we've got to focus on because that's a real mm -hmm. important aspect to make sure the program functions well for the community members so but uh, <laughs> right now we're anticipating you know everything looks good but it's it's going to be online based Does that and, get what you're asking? and will you give us when you give us the the registration numbers and all um will you let us know will you show us comparative numbers for since covid so that we can see whether the same number are registering. Well, we'll share the latest information we can. I, I, and so, yes. We'll, but by year. Yes, sure. Yeah. Yep. yep. Great. Thank you. OK, Dan. Yeah, I've got a, um, uh, several uh, quick uh, verbal updates in the spirit of keeping uh, in, as informed as we can. Uh, we are landing on a, uh, the community uh, meeting uh, to discuss uh, a little recap of 2020 and to look ahead at 2021 with regards to prairie dog management. And uh, uh, that date is December 14th. Um, and so we have a, a item on matters from the board announcing announcement of upcoming public meetings. We put it on uh, this calendar because we weren't sure exactly when that was going to fall. We could certainly still take care of that item, Kurt, now, but there's still November as well uh, to announce that because we would expect that there'll be uh, uh, interest amongst the board members to attend that, uh, uh, that virtual um, meeting. But so December 14th, you can kind of pencil mm -hmm. in on your calendars now. And of course, mm -hmm. we send out reminders uh, to you as as we get closer, and uh, I'll let Kurt decide if under Madison Board whether we go ahead and announce that upcoming meeting uh, at this month or next month. Um, hey, just a quick question on that, Dan. Uh, so it's described as the Prairie Dog Working Group annual meeting. Yeah. Um, is is that going to become one and the same as our new Prairie Dog Management actions in the project area? public reporting meeting? Yeah, John, okay. you clarify that? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. We're, we're, we've separated into two projects, Kurt. So we'll have right. the Prairie Dog Working Group project and we'll have the Restore Irrigated Ag Fields project. And both of those will be reporting at that same meeting. Okay, you, you might want to use a more general term for that meeting because I think it's covering more than just the Prairie Dog Working Group. That's my, that's my question, I guess. So anyway, just a thought. Yeah, okay, and my, my instinct is to announce it sooner rather than withhold the information so that people can get it on their calendars. It's a busy time of year. I would agree. Yeah, and that was one of the purpose for me sharing it right now because okay. we 
nailed down the date and you know we didn't have to to technically announce it to you all until November but uh, giving you a couple head a couple months heads up and uh, and, and that's going to be in the evening or I think it's six o'clock is that right John it's yeah. 5 30. Yeah, 530. Oh, okay. 14th. This is listed on our upcoming calendar at the bottom, guys. Ah. <laughs> it, it, may be, it may be 6 p.m., but we'll we'll clarify that. Okay. Oh, it says 530 there. I didn't even notice the footnote. I didn't either. <laughs> now we know. <laughs> now we know. Um, any other questions on that particular date? Otherwise, I just want to let you know that we've uh, gotten some information coming out of CPW uh, in regards to ELDO, uh, uh, ELDO Visitor Use Master Plan. And you may be noticing for several months now that we've been carrying multiple dates of when we want to uh, carve out time under matters from the board for the board to provide feedback. And for instance, on this, on our tentative board calendar right now, it's listed as both November and December. Um, it's going to be December for you all, uh, given the uh, announcement uh, of how long the public comment window is going to be open, is uh, the December meeting will provide you with uh, more than adequate time to um, formulate feedback and for us uh, to get it into CPW. Um, so just wanted to uh, clarify because you probably saw two hold dates for that and, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, December 9th will uh, be the date we'll land on to uh, carve out that time under matters from the board uh, for you on that. And comments are due when? Um, we're, I don't, uh, my understanding, and I don't know if anybody's on that could clarify the exact date, but I think, I think that it's been set yet, Dan. You know, through, through the month of no December. Yeah, they haven't um, specifically um chosen a date for the beginning and the end but we have um an indication that it'll be later in december so um we will we can update you when we have the information from cpw they haven't provided the, the exact dates yet and just uh in response to uh ray's comments during public comment um has the has there been any further assessment of the uh hca habitat over in that area? No, there hasn't. Uh, well, go ahead, Casey. No, we haven't. Uh, I think we were waiting um, for that for that element of the board motion to to do that uh, later on after we had addressed some of the transportation uh, issues. Yeah, and so I just uh, one comment back to Ray and, and to the board is um, we are not putting any time pressure on ourselves. For instance, by us waiting to see how this process plays out and then going back to look at the board's motion and what we need to be responsive to, we will take the time that's needed to do that judiciously, holistically, and thoroughly. So uh, uh, rest assured it will not be a rushed process. Uh, depending on the outcome of the bump, um, if, it's, if, it, if it's all for that we continue on and, and incorporating the board's motion that they made in February of 2019, we will take the time that's needed to do it right, um, and it will not be a rush process. So I just want to make sure that Ray hears that and that the board hears that. Uh, I just wanted to uh, also uh, clarify uh, what you might have seen in your upcoming calendar and some changes that have taken place. So uh, based on what we uh, heard from uh, several of the trustees at the last uh, at, at, at a previous meeting is that we have uh, pushed out the our time frame uh, in regards to the agricultural lease assignment guidelines in order to uh, more robustly engage with the agricultural community. Uh, specifically, there was an interest to have us reach out uh, with survey information uh, or uh, request the surveys of all past participants into the program, as well as current leases. And so we have deci we decided to do that. And that uh, survey has now gone out and uh, that the survey period has closed. And we are now starting to analyze that information. 
And uh, that will all be compiled into information that we'll share with the OSBT in January. So right now, this staff is also working on the initial draft revisions uh, uh, that's uh, currently being reviewed by staff and incorporating some of the feedback we're getting back from our agricultural community. Uh, and that's, uh, then staff will run by any major changes to the uh, assignment guidelines to the agricultural community for initial feedback. And that will take place over the next month or so. We will then put that all together in a red line version for all of you. And we're going to share that red line version out in a written informational packet in December. And so you'll have a, a over a month to be looking at that uh, 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 potential changes and that uh, we will then uh, um, ask for your feedback at the January meeting. So we just pushed back the timeline a little bit in order to be more responsive to some suggestions we heard from the board about uh, more robust engagement with our community agricultural community. Caroline, can you mute it? Yep. Yeah, thank you. Um, Dan, I know at the, the meeting when we discussed this, you guys said that you were going to do some on foot um, speaking with, with our current Lucy's. Is that still going to happen? That you were going to go to the location and speak with them, or did I hear that wrong? You sort of were kind of cutting it out. I think your question was, is beyond uh, a survey, did we do any in-person engagement? Is that? Yeah. yeah, I thought that I heard that from our last meeting that there was going to be some of that, that um, uh, several staff members were going to, to go and speak with um, our farmers. I, yeah. But did I hear that properly at the last meeting? Yeah, John, do you have any more details or details on that particular question? Yeah, Dan, um, Caroline, the uh, staff have um, had conversations now with the tenants that would be affected by the plans for 2021 and still working out all the details on that, but um, there is a robust conversation going on with uh, affected tenants. We'll also be reaching out to other tenants to let them know what the plans are ahead of the meeting on the 14th. Okay, and then um, just to make sure that I, I understood the survey um, already went out to all of the current farmers and passed and you've received them all back and, and now you're compiling the data. Is that what I heard? Yeah, as far as the, the agricultural lease guidelines survey, John, I think the surveys are all out and that period is closed. Is that correct? Yeah, and that was uh, the survey was to pass participants in the process. Uh, so that includes most of our, our tenants. Yes. Okay. And the next round of lease uh, requests it starts when? Uh, go ahead, John. The, um, that will uh, we will put out any opportunities for 2021 uh, in January February time frame, Karen. Um, so, so right after the board meeting, then you'll. Okay. So uh, we will wait <laughs> to do any until after we get feedback from the board. Yeah. yeah, that was the one thing we wanted to make sure that we weren't creating a situation where we where we'll not be able to be responsive to your feedback. So. Uh, Andy felt uh, comfortable that we would have time to incorporate your feedback and still not uh, stray too much for what we typically would do. Well, I, I think that was what we had talked about was um, if, if we were sending out these surveys via email, um, did we feel that we were going to get good participation requests that way just because, um, you know, some people are super savvy with their emails. Did you find good participation survey uh, results? Did, did, did you get 100% or less than that? Um, I, I would say uh, that we were not uh, really happy with the survey, with the number of participants in the survey. It, it wouldn't be up to Colin Leslie's standards at all, um, but uh, it, it did give us good valuable information from the folks that we did hear from. It is uh, kind of tough audience to get uh, feedback from in that manner, I, I believe. So um, that's why we're going to continue to engage with them as we're developing the actual um, changes in the potential, potential changes in the policy. Okay, yeah. I, I know that we had discussed that. So I didn't know if you guys were able to do a follow up with phone calls for the people that didn't respond to the survey. You know, maybe they just didn't even see it. 
Um, no, we did not do that. Um, we have not done that, but we, uh, we are going to take the information that we did get, turn that into a set of bullets or proposals, and then um, run that by uh, the tenants further. I really appreciate you're doing the additional outreach. I think the whole board is go with that. So Kurt, that is, uh, uh, completes my verbal updates and, and that would be the last agenda item that matters. Okay, good. Thank you, Dan. So um, we're to matters from the board. Uh, Briefly, this is what I have so far, and we can add topics uh, that people want to cover. We've got A, which is uh, update on the upstream option analysis for South Boulder Creek. B, I think we've covered, which is the announcement of upcoming meetings, but we'll do a check there to see. Uh, item C is the retreat. Uh, D is um, this letter of request from council that I would like to get your input on. I've got E is Trail maintenance for Karen, is that right? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, anything else that people want to cover under matters from the board? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'd like to just do a very brief uh, report back to the whole board on where we are with the Prairie Dog and Agricultural Productivity Shared Learning Ooh. work. Yes, okay, I'm adding just so that. Board, Thank you. Just so the board knows what's going on. Very good idea. Anybody else have anything for matters from the board? Um, I also have a couple questions about the gun club business. Okay. Okay. Well, then we're going to dive right in. Um, the first one is uh, update on the scope and timeline for the analysis of the upstream option for South Boulder Creek flood mitigation. Um, I'm not gonna go into a lot of details. We've had uh, several meetings and discussions with uh, the, what's essentially the CU South process subcommittee, which is headed up by uh, Mayor Weaver and uh, Councilwoman Friend. Uh, we've had meetings with that group or discussions with uh, utility staff on technical questions, August 5th, the 20th, the 25th, September the 18th, the 21st, and the 25th. <clears throat> I will summarize in just a couple sentences where I think we are at, and it could be a long discussion, and I don't think we'll go into that because I don't want to, I don't want to prejudge what the outcomes are going to be. The utility staff have done a lot uh, to provide us more information, uh, starting with much more detail about the analysis that they presented to the board, uh, our board on June 3rd, uh, you know, particularly that those issues that were raised by uh, the figure B1, and they've given us much more detail about that. They've made uh, some additional model runs to analyze possible concepts for diverting that westerly flow and storing it within the CU South Mind area. They've also then looked at the effects of that storage on downstream flows and what happens with those downstream flows and the potential to remove the US 36 flood wall element. <clears throat> uh, at our request, uh, the staff is now assessing or giving us a, a more formal assessment uh, of the feasibility of those storage concepts under state dam safety regulations and general engineering practices. Um, they're developing a report and expect to uh, come back to us for our November meeting and get feedback from us. It would then go into their report to council uh, in early December. Uh, Dan, you may have more detailed understanding, but that's my general understanding of the sequence going forward. Yeah, Kurt, I think that was uh, well summarized. There has been a, a change. It's not quite formalized, but it's it's very likely that January 5th is going to be the date that they're going to go to council. Um, so um, that was uh, uh, an item that came up on Monday. 
at the uh, uh, CAC. CAC, thank you. <laughs> and, um, so I was I didn't attend, so I didn't hear it. But uh, <laughs> they were uh, that was a date, and it just happened that the December fifteenth was so overloaded that we knew something had to give. And uh, I'm sure utility staff appreciated a little extra time to take your feedback because we were running into Thanksgiving the week right after that. And so we'll give them a little bit more time to you know, provide your feedback. But just so you all know, it looks like January 5th will be the council date. Uh, is it your guess then, Dan, maybe it's what you're saying that the current expectation is that the utility staff would be briefing us at December meeting rather no, than November? No, uh, no, it's still on for November 18th. And okay. they are okay. still shooting to provide you with documents about two weeks ahead of time instead of a week ahead of time. So they're shooting for uh, like November 4th in terms of being able to get you the report. So. Um, um, Excellent, That's, that would be very helpful. Yep. Yeah, and I just want to add that I, I have really been impressed with the willingness of Joe Tariucci and Brandon Coleman to, to meet with us, uh, as Kurt said, on all those dates that he called out. Um, and uh, my understanding is that the report that, uh, as Dan says, we're going to be getting on November 4th, um, will contain citations from state law or regulations that set forth the requirements for tie-ins because the point that we're at now is um, whether the eastern side of an upstream dam would need to be tied into the bedrock cliff on both the east and the west side of the South Boulder Creek Valley or based on similar to the way that Brandon has diagrammed it or whether it could be tied into the bedrock cliff on the west side and have the east side of the bathtub grounded in the bedrock directly underground as RJH showed in their diagram in 2018. And we, we decided in our last uh, office hours meeting with them that this is really an important decision element and that we really need to see the the state laws and regulations and what they say about those kinds of tie-ins. Yeah, having, uh, I'm not part of the report writing and so I haven't seen any draft yet, but <clears throat> they received Kurt's letter. It's been talked about extensively, not only with you, but within, within the utilities department. I would very much expect to have that letter and the spirit of that letter be incorporated into the final report how they intend to do it, <clears throat> reference, I'm, I'm not privy to. John, I don't know if you've seen anything yet, but uh, I'm fully expecting that the spirit of that letter is gonna be part of the final report. Right. That's my understanding as well, Dan. And, and Dan, uh, maybe this is obvious to everybody, but uh, your staff will write part of that report to address potential consequences of the uh, storage concept that we've been kicking around. Yeah, I mean, we fully expect that uh, John and Don and myself will will have ample time to uh, provide input, feedback, and even on those open space related matters to provide direct information into the final report. Um, so, yeah, we'll. Uh, it's not quite our time yet, but we'll be very right. active over the next few weeks in that. Okay, very good. Any other questions or thoughts about that? It's a very complicated uh, thing that we just summarized briefly, but. Just a question for Caroline, Dave, or, or Hal. Um, have any of you attempted to go back and listen to the recordings and did it, I mean, is it, uh, as far as the meetings that were recorded, any issues with being able to access it and listen to it and um, just out of curiosity? I was, I attended two of the meetings. Okay, I great. I back to listen to, I believe, the first one that I didn't go to, but I was able to be there for the others. Okay. The other uh, forgive me, I didn't oh. realize my video was off. Yeah, navigating pretty well. Um, easy enough on the recent recordings. Yeah, that, that might be. Have they been able to get up the, 
the model runs that show the flood flows yet? Do you know? They were having trouble getting them up because they were such large files last I heard. Mm. Yeah, we, John, we discussed that at one of the uh, meetings last week or the week before, and I'm not, I'm not sure how they resolved that, or I, I think <laughs> are fully expecting to be able to uh, have the model runs be an important part of mm. educating the community and the board. Uh, I'm not so sure where they're at on it in terms of right now, but. Um, I was just looking to see if they got them up here. Karen, did they load on your computer at the model runs? No, staff has been showing them to us in our meetings, but we haven't had access to them. And what, what we've gotten is, um, uh, I'm sorry, we've gotten PDFs of various graphics, and but not the full output of the runs. But you've seen the full output of the runs on their computer, like at the meeting? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, these are like yeah, little videos that show the water flows during certain assumptions. Okay. And that was one of my questions of if you're going back to a recording, how that all played out and where they were able to follow that. And because that's, those are pretty, the model runs are pretty critical. And obviously they'll be a part of your presentation, but um, trying to get them up on the site too. Right. Yeah, I, I don't see them up on the site yet. Um, okay. So they're probably still working on it. <laughs> with that but they will definitely be part of the presentation to the board in, in November. Yeah we even had a backup plan right of actually just videotaping the model run on the computer as like worst case scenario like low tech. <laughs> <laughs> well I'm sure we will get an update from anybody that knows anything new at our next uh, meeting in November. Uh, <clears throat> okay anything else I'm going to go on then to item C which is our retreat. We had the first uh, retreat and I thought it was really good and on October 28th from 9 to noon we're going to do our second virtual retreat. Uh, the two sessions very similar about you know taking care of what we have and understanding the cost of that and dealing with increasing visitation. Um, what I think I didn't see were those emails to me with people volunteering to facilitate those sessions. So I'm going to exercise the power of the chair to say that, Karen, you're going to facilitate the first session at the retreat, taking care of what we have, maintenance focused future. I give it to Hal, but he's already had one. so. And I again want to thank Hal for suggesting this idea. It was a really good one. And then Dave, you're going to do the next one, which is managing for increasing visitation. Thank you for volunteering to both of you. And um, Kurt and Hal, um, I had a long weekend, so you might have to just twist my brain. Yeah, we do have a meeting set up. Yep. Okay. We do. Uh, we're meeting on uh, October 20th just to kind of touch base on getting ourselves ready. Again, from the staff's perspective, it will be a light, you know, uh, a light staff presence in the beginning with a, a, a brief presentation just to whet your appetite and uh, kind of spur conversation. But otherwise, it's your session. We didn't want to interfere too much. But uh, so similar format, a, a, a brief opening. Uh, Brief presentation, then turn it over to you for both. <clears throat> Kurt, you and I and Hal. And I was just sure when you said light, you were going to say light lunch. I would oh, love yeah. to see that myself. Yeah. <laughs> That's up to you. <laughs> Dan, I might suggest that uh, when you've figured out who's taken the lead in making the two presentations, that we have. Karen talked to the lead for the first session and Dave talked to the lead for the second session so they can just understand a little bit better what's going to be presented. I think that'll help them get their facilitation uh, hats on. Okay. Great. You're muted, Dave. <clears throat> you wanted to say thank you. <laughs> yeah, th yeah th thank you very much. I was hoping that uh, it would come out this way. Yeah. And um, Caroline and I were going to meet with staff to uh, continue working on the 
staff board responsibility matrix. Uh, and I was just wondering if we can do that so that we have something to bring back uh, for conversation at the retreat. Well, I mean, if you guys will have something for us to look at, I think you could send it out to everybody ahead of the retreat and we can, we're sort of, if I'm remembering right, Dan, we've reserved a little bit of time at the end of that uh, session for sort of everything that we didn't get to talk about. Yeah, um, to be uh, in all fairness and honesty, our meeting tomorrow, I'm meeting with the director's team in which we're gonna talk about the upcoming retreat. Um, and obviously, Dave, I think what you're kind of referring is, hey, board, uh, staff hasn't heard, the board hasn't heard anything from staff on that. <laughs> and you haven't missed anything because we have not uh, moved on that. Um, so I'll check in tomorrow with what we're, uh, what we're thinking in terms of seeing what we can move forward over the next couple of weeks. And uh, uh, we'll check back in with you. Great, thanks. Thanks for remembering that, guys. <clears throat> Okay, uh, Karen, I'm to the first of your several items of uh, trail maintenance. Um, I just wanted to say a, a, a couple of things. I went out to um, the Marshall Cowdery Trail to see the reconstruction work that uh, Dan told us about in the last mid-month memo. Um, <coughs> And I went out there for a couple of reasons. One was to see what it was like to hike on a bike trail that had a dominantly bike trail that had recently been um, worked on. And, and so my first comment is how delighted I was to learn how easy it is to hike on that Marshall Cowdery Trail. It doesn't have the V, you know, bike tire thread through the middle that's impossible to hike on. And it doesn't have all the swervy, um, curvy things that the Marshall Trail has further west. Um, and so I just wanted staff to know that it's just a delightful hiking trail as well as biking trail, which I think <laughs> is the standard that we aspire to and that, that I, I was just really pleased with that. My question is um, whether staff has any strategies or um, ideas that they're focusing on to prevent the kind of, of degradation that was necessary to do out there such a relatively short time after the trail was built because that trail is relatively new in comparison with, with trails in our system. And um, I was surprised that already it has the level of degradation that needs trail work on it. Um, one of the kinds of things that I saw that I anticipate is provoked the, the work is the kind of swervy uh, like half moon areas off the side of a trail that the bikes make. And, I, and it seems to me we need to be thinking about how to prevent the need for maintenance as opposed to just how to always keep going back out and doing more maintenance. And I'm wondering if staff has been thinking about that, whether they have any strategies for how to manage bike use on our trails to, to prevent the, the need for uh, the restoration maintenance work. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great question. I, 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 what I think I'm hearing from you, Karen, is there's kind of two questions and one like a, uh, a Russian doll box, right? One fits into the other is, is what is our strategies to, uh, um, when we're in order to reduce maintenance of a trail in general, and then do, is there anything specifically on a bike design trail that we're looking at um, as well. So kind of two questions related to each other. Yeah, um, and since this trail is, is really heavily a bike trail, um, I really wasn't thinking of the bigger question, but that's a worthwhile question as well. 
Yeah, yeah. So um, our, our trail standards um, yep. uh, that we've been really, really, that's been a big focus of ours in the last five years. And of course, uh, then prioritizing how we apply and, and looking at those standards and how to apply our annual work planning items based on the priorities of trails that are out of compliance. Um, uh, there's a lot of good reasons to really start to heavily employ the, uh, the trail standards that are in place. And um, I don't know, Jim, if readers, if you're able to sort of elaborate on this, but I, I, I can say a couple of different things is um, we had a quite a robust conversation in 2018 with uh, Jarrett and Chad on looking at the development of standards and then how we apply those standards to uh, across our trail system to identify those trails that are in need of upgrades, possibly a reroute on the most extreme situation or, or place in, in lighter situations. Um, and we can certainly come back with a little bit more of a, uh, a more in-depth report of how this, how this particular section was identified and why it was identified and why it was prioritized. Um, we could provide that as a written follow-up. Um, but I, I have a feeling, Karen, your question might be more general in nature. Uh, than yeah, it's more how do, how do we prevent from having to do so much, um, go back and fix it again and again and again. Yeah. Well, I, uh, Jim, I don't know if you're able to comment on why, what, provoked us, what was the issue that we had to um, address that was originally, I mean, it, it's, it is probably a trail design issue that we were dealing with um, of why we uh, needed to go back and reroute this. I fully expect that the new design that we put in is, is going to answer that exact question of based on how we did that trail design, that reroute, is going to prevent us from being out there again um, uh, with having to redo this particular trail, reroute this trail, but. Yeah, it's less the reroute that I'm concerned about. I understand the reroute issue. Mm -hmm. It's more the, the ongoing maintenance of the Marshall Cowdery connector trail, the one that, the, it hasn't been in for that long. I don't know what year it was built, but. Um, and it just runs straight across from Marshall out to the county road. Mm -hmm. And, but it, as a young trail, it's already got, you know, the swerves in it and the kind of, of uh, degradation that requires in-place maintenance. And I'm wondering if, if the trails group has thought at all about how to prevent degradation and the need for maintenance. Well, Karen, yes, we have thought about that. We think about it every day. Uh, oh, there's Jim. Hi, Jim. Hi. Where are you? Where's your face? <laughs> if you have to turn the camera on, I would do that. Uh, <laughs> I don't see a button for that, and I'm afraid to push any other button. To, so, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, so a couple of things. Uh, this particular reroute was identified uh, in the uh, uh, study that we did in, in looking at uh, whether our uh, trails comply with our standards or not. This partic that particular section was totally red. You know, most of our trails are just partially red, but that one was totally red. Uh, and, uh, and are you talking about the one that comes up from below or the one that goes straight across? The one that, the, 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 basically it's a connector from Marshall to, to Calgary. The new, the yeah, new I'm talking about the one that goes straight across at about the same elevation all the way across from Marshall to the county road. Yeah, you know, again, we, we are looking at that, but, but certainly that, the, the uh, issues on that trail are not totally red. Uh, so right. Prioritizing, we prioritize this connector at this point. But we are looking at that and uh, we will be taking whatever... Uh, measures we can when we do our sweep, which is in the fall and the spring. Uh, smaller, uh, we, we just don't, we, there's not a, a reroute uh, in, in our future for that. Uh, yeah, but my question is not about reroutes. 
it's about preventing the need for maintenance. Is, is there any way that, that user behaviors can be influenced in a way to, to prevent the degradation of the trails? Yes, we think there is. And, and every time we put in a trail or, or uh, do some maintenance, we're trying new and different things. Uh, we believe that the designs that we're using today, uh, had we put that in that in trail that uh, you're talking about, we would not have nearly the problems that we've got there. Uh, it, it, it's, you know, it's not that old, but it's, it's not uh, one of our newer, newer designs either. Uh, so, uh, you know, every time we do something, we watch it, we may uh, monitor it, and we will make adjustments. So uh, depending on the situation, yeah, I think there's lots of things we can do. So Karen, may I suggest a couple of things here? Um, I know that Chad and Jared is, are reaching out to individual board members because in 2018, we were doing site visits. We had a big conversation on maintenance and uh, I know that they wanna be able to offer that to other of the other trustees, and I think they've reached out to sell or view to see if you want to go out on site. That invitation is open to all five trustees. Um, perhaps what uh, I'm also hearing is the very specific notion of when you're looking at preventative uh, actions that can reduce maintenance, specifically for mountain bike trails. Is there something, is there a different thinking we need to do? Is there a different set of strategies? Is there a different things that the user group could do? And may I suggest that maybe I, we could put that to Chad and Jim and they could provide some sort of written information uh, in order to supplement any field visits that you all would like to do with them. And uh, we'll, we'll put something together in a written format and uh, for an upcoming board meeting. And uh, hopefully between a, a site visit that any of you wanna take advantage of and uh, information on, on more of the specific question Karen is asking, I think for mountain bike user trails. Um, That'd be great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks everyone. Um, Karen, your next one is uh, the Paradox Shared Learning Collaborative that is uh, coalesced here. Well, um, and I don't know who should be speaking. Kurt and Dave and Karen have all <laughs> taken a shot at, at least for me, li listening in as opposed to directly participating in these meetings. But I thought it was important for, for Hal and Caroline and any public that's still on um, to know that there's a, a collaborative shared learning group that's um, been meeting I don't know, maybe a, a close to once every three weeks or four weeks, um, that is doing what I think is some really constructive work. It's made up of prairie dog advocates, of agricultural irrigated ag uh, aggregate uh, advocates, and uh, what they're trying to do um, is work with staff to identify a property where some experimentation um, would well be done under a, an OSMP lease um, to learn whether it's possible to have productive agricultural uh, operation and prairie dog occupancy on a property simultaneously. And they're zeroing into a property that's uh, just north of the Cottonwood Trail and east of, is it 71st, Dave, have I got that right? Um, where there's, um, there's vegetation, it's mostly bindweed kind of vegetation, but there's certainly vegetation and, and uh, at least a reasonable amount of, of soils there, and there's prairie dog occupancy, and the young farmer who's the head of the young farmer organization um, is and Marcus Garvey are representing the ag community. Um, and it, 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 they're having some very interesting discussions and, and I think it's important that the board sort of be aware that this is going on and keep track of, of the work that they do. Yeah, we should probably get John uh, Potter too to sort of chime in about uh, 
what he's been doing with this group because I think uh, he's really helped move it forward. Yep. Uh, well, I thought Karen um, summarized that really well. Uh, this group has approached staff about the possibility of doing this collaborative effort on, on, on that property that Karen mentioned. Um, we looked at a, we looked at several sites, and that one. Uh, rose to the top. These were areas that are currently unleased. So we have no uh, tenant for these sites and we felt like from a standard uh, leasing arrangement that that would not be possible because of the prairie dog impacts. So that it's, they are good candidates for us to receive proposals on, on how somebody might experiment and do something different and p potentially come up with some uh, co-existent co strategies that would, would be interesting and effective on other properties that the city owns. So, so we um, will- And it's an irrigated property, right, John? It is, it is irrigated, yes, Karen. Um, so what we've talked about is just using our existing um, uh, approach process that's in the ag land use guidelines to uh, accept proposals from this group or anyone else. We don't want to um, just be doing something favorable to this, this group. We wanna make sure that we're fair across the whole ag community on any properties that we um, make available. So, um, so we're working through the details on, on how that process could work. And uh, I'm sure we'll be back with a, an update uh, for you very soon if, if, this, if this continues to to work to work itself out. Dave, did you want to add some? Yeah, John, I have a question. John, do you think or are you anticipating that an update or report will be part of the December 14th meeting on on this particular effort? Uh, yes, possibly, Dave. If if the, it depending on how um, how this develops, one thing we we have to the staff have not discussed, but we need to. Um, come come to understand is the best way to to do this whether we uh, proceed with a negotiated assignment under the current ag land use guidelines or wait for January or February mm. which this group is excited and they want to get going so I don't know so we're sort of kind of working through those issues and if if we can we will um, include it or make it uh, make an announcement about it on the December 14th meeting. Yes. Well, yeah, that's One thing I would just add, um, you know, it's not like our staff needs anything more to do with prairie dogs right now, some more work. Uh, but I think the, one of the, the great ideas that John has had here is to basically put it within the leasing program and so that it becomes a contract with the operator to do these things. And, uh, you know, if they're, this group does seem quite interested in science and monitoring and so that can be part of their stewardship plan for the property and maybe not have our staff having to do all of that so anyway i thought that was very clever yeah caroline is it uh, the prairie dog advocates is it is it mostly the prairie dog working group or all of them it, no, it's a couple people from it, each interest area. Lindsay Sterling Crank and Pam, is it Wanick? Are the two prairie dog advocates in this group? Okay, great. And then um, the, the property size, are, are we trying to do it with the whole property or did they pick a certain amount of acreage to work with? Do you guys know? Um, what we've talked about is potent, uh, it's not the whole property, but the irrigated portions uh, of it. So. That, yeah. that's probably what we would focus on. Yeah, I definitely um, would like to know more or, you know, help out in any way possible. So um, I could reach out to a couple people about that. So Karen, have you been out there to the site with them? They haven't gone out as a group. People as individuals have gone out under COVID guidelines yeah. <laughs> with masks. <laughs> so the meetings have been virtual when it's both groups working together? Oh, it's all been on Zoom. All virtual. Okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to know more. That sounds, that sounds great. I, I think it is a really good activity for so many different reasons. And I appreciate the willingness of John and others to 
take on one more thing and try to give birth to this. So thank yeah. you. Um, let's see, uh, gun club, Karen. Yeah, my last question about gun club uh, is about, um, as I understand it from what Bethany sent us today, there's an October 20th commissioner's meeting. Uh, and she said staff was planning on being there uh, to answer any questions that might come up, but not to make a formal comment, as I understand it, if I've got that right. Um, and, um, what concerns me is not the moving the trail so that it's our out of harm's way uh, for, for the OSMP property and users, but the impact on users. And we brought this up when the board discussed this many moons ago. Um, the impact of the noise on OSMP visitors and um, now that there's been a noise survey done, we know that um, that uh, there that both noise surveys have been done and that additional noise surveys will be done. And my concern is that that the noise, based on what the commissioner's uh, document says at this point, will be 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. seven days a week, plus till 9 p.m. one day a week, which means, and, and my experience when I went out there is it's like having shingles put on on the townhouse mm -hmm. next door to you. It's pow, 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 pow. And, and with five times more pows, um, I just don't know how we're going to have acceptable levels of noise for OSMP visitors out on our property that's adjacent to that, even if we move the trail. And I, I think it's, my personal opinion is that it's important to convey that to the commissioners. And I don't know how, what there, whether there's a route to do that whether it could be a memo from the board, whether the board could appoint somebody to go and speak at the commissioner's meeting, or whether I just ought to keep my mouth shut and go to bed <laughs> and forget about it. But it concerns me greatly, and it's an impact that will... will persist forever. Persist forever, that's the right word. And it's not insignificant. And the more and the more we've learned since the board last took this up, the the worse it's become. I just ask something real quick before you respond. This, uh, from what I gathered, this gun club is where um, the police officers will practice as well. So it's, I mean, it's it's necessary to be there. It's the police uh, officers. It's the rangers, and it's everybody from up in the uh, forest service lands uh, yeah. to the west of, of the lowlands who they want to get out of the forest service and down in a facility. That so it's going to be five times the volume of the gunshots that are there now. Yeah, that was what I got. It was, it was multiple agencies that need to use the space. And individuals. And private. Members of yeah. the gun club as well as public. And, and of course, that's a, all of these are laudatory goals. We can only speculate about how much this will get the sort of freelance people out of the forest. But I do think it is good to have a place like this. I do share Karen's concern that a lot of the noise stuff in their uh, proposal is based on modeling. And it's one thing to model this stuff. It's another thing to measure it afterwards. It's another thing to be required to comply with certain standards. Uh, our experience, I think, generally is once you build a facility like this, it's almost impossible to force real mitigation on them. And they'll, they may get to a point where they can't mitigate the noise. And then, so anyway. Um, and it's, a re it's, it's a repetitive noise. It's not yeah. just noise. It's a, I, yeah. 
So Dan, your staff have made comments. Uh, we, we, we don't have the standing as, as the landowner. Um, do you have any thoughts about what well, the board Well, I mean, um, I don't have any new thoughts, to be honest. I mean, we've been, as you know, we've uh, provided a series of comments and reiterated those comments again and resubmitted those comments uh, this fall. I've been keeping you up to date on when the comment periods are over the past two years or so. So, um, you know, we are, as a referral agency, our staff does work pretty um, comprehensively on projects, especially projects that we see could have a greater impact uh, on open space. And, you know, I, I feel like the set of comments that we submitted were pretty robust and pretty thorough. And, you know, I think Bethany does a really good job of reaching across all department staff and providing that input. Uh, I fully expect that Bethany will be at the hearing if there's any questions about the comments that we have submitted. In regards to the board, um, you know, I guess, you know, that would be your issue with, is, is how, how <laughs> is either as individuals or as a board that you wish to provide any, any, any comments. Um, I mean, I, I think the easy thing since the department has submitted comments is for board members to go and say, we stand by the staff's comments and we hope they're considered very seriously. To go beyond that, the board would have to form our own additional comments that may be challenging to do in the time available. Uh, but I would certainly say each of us should take a look at what staff has submitted and decide if we want to show up and say, pay attention to these. Um, okay. yeah, Caroline. Caroline. Caroline, go ahead, then we'll get Dave. Um, has the gun club been there um, since before I was born in 1984? Has that been like <laughs> <before>? <laughs> yeah, it was before all of us were born. <laughs> okay. the early Pleistocene. Okay, and then the silver miners. <laughs> <laughs> but is this the first growth? Of it is this the first um, expansion that it's that it's had, or has there been several? Uh, Dave, it's your turn. Go, Dave. Yeah. Well, Dan can Dan can answer that. I guess. No, no, I can't. I was going to look for help. So, okay, Dave. <laughs> uh, there, there. Over the years, there have been several uh, efforts to expand. Uh, they're ex they have expanded slightly, but this is. Uh, kind of a, a different level this is a kind of a monumental expansion so yeah. the, the ones previously um you know open space commented on it um but they were rather minor but i guess um kurt i just wanted to say i i do share uh, karen's concerns very very much and dan i guess i would i think the staff and probably you ought to comment because I think the impression is is that if if the trail gets moved, then okay. that's sufficient mitigation. And the fact of the matter is is that I've been out there for about forty years, and there is not anywhere on that property that the, that kind of impact is going to be either minimal or non-existent. And so. I think the notion that, oh, we just moved the trail and, and the gun club provides some compensation for doing that and everything will be fine uh, is not accurate at all. And I, I think we need to emphasize that if this goes through the impacts to visitors and on, you know, just ranching operations out there are going to be constant and never ending. Yeah, it's like a war zone. I mean, it's like Vietnam it when you're out there on the Hidden Valley Trail, and uh, and I think uh, Karen's right. If you expand it by f a factor of five, uh, it's definitely going to be that. And seven to seven is every day. I mean, that's the only time the visitors are out there. I mean, you know, that that area is not 
and theoretically is not open at least uh, the parking the trailhead parking is not open after uh, dark so yeah and there's not a single day that you could go out there for a little bit of peace and quiet yeah and, and karen and dave this is uh, this is Bethany. Can you guys hear me? Oh, hi. Yes. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to unmute and I'm in in the country, so to speak. So I have terrible uh, connection right now. Um, but I did want to point out as far as as far as commenting versus formal comments. So we will uh, I will be present at the meeting, um, likely be asked to answer questions related to our comments. Um, I'm not sure if you had a chance to listen to the Planning Commission meeting or not, but a great deal of their comments and reason for not supporting the application were related to a failure of the applicant to show or to be able to show a 50% noise reduction. Uh, so basically what they did was take their current noise and say not only do you need to reduce that but you need to reduce the the projected increase in noise by 50 percent and so um so our comment or our you know basically we would be supporting their the the planning commission's um uh, requirements or or request for that 50% noise reduction of even their future uh, uh, you know noise impacts so does that help answer kind of the the noise issues you're, you're that, asking about does that mean 50% of the added noise or 50% less than the current level of noise exactly so so um, they were, it, it, it was really saying if you're going, so they wanted to see what the current noise was. So what their current noise was plus what their noise studies were. So they went out and of course did some shooting out there um, uh, at their current facility and then extrapolated that to what the expansion would be. And so they basically said, in order to expand, we want to see a 50% reduction of the noise you're currently showing, oh. including the studies. It, again, yeah. based on what I was hearing. Um, so it wasn't, you know, so it was in order to approve the expansion, they wanted to see that, which they couldn't show. So the planning commission denied their application or, or didn't support the applicant said, we think we're showing everything that complies with county code, et cetera. We want to take our, our application forward to the commissioners. And so our, you know, it, it, if and when asked questions, we would say we support the the efforts or the the requirements of the plan commission, which is to show a reduction in order to approve the expansion, a reduction in the noise. They do not, if rejected, they do not have to they do not have to decrease their noise that they currently make by fifty percent. Does that make sense? Right. <laughs> okay. I think I think the wording that you you used just in the last phrase that you said is really important. Mm -hmm. and a fifty percent reduction of the current noise level. Right. Yeah. The current key. and future. <laughs> yes. Yes. I the, think that the key bad, that I'm glad. Uh, well, I'm glad I, Bethany made this clear is that the leverage they're trying to use is that if we don't approve their project then we're going to have to live with the existing noise level. I mean, that's basically- Oh, we have to live with that now. Correct. Well, but the, yep. what's mm -hmm. on the table, theoretically, if you approve the project, we'll have to reduce it to half. Now, I think, Bethany, you're saying that they don't have any evidence they can do that. Correct. And they want the commissioners to consider their application even without that. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's that very helpful, helpful, Bethany. Yeah, and if, if we need to do any clarifications tomorrow on that, uh, given that Bethany's out in the hinterlands and probably relying on, on memory. But so 
what I'm hearing, Bethany, is let's say their noise could be calculated at 50 and their expansion is you're adding 30, now you're at 80, is they want a 50% reduction of the 80 to bring it down to 40. No, no, no. Below the yes. current value? Yes. 50% reduction oh. of the 50 currently. Yes. And then what about, well, okay. So it'd be to 25. No, because the decibel curve is, is logarithmic. Well, okay, yes, if you're oh, using boy. a log curve. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, I can get I can get their exact like ex yeah, let, expectation let's, from <laughs> yeah. Let, let's yeah. follow up with with exactly what the planning commission said and, and Yep, that. no problem. Dave, that what you going to say? Well, well, I think I I think that sounds fine, but I also think we ought to reemphasize that moving the trail is not a satisfactory mitigation uh, factor, and that. Um, that should not be considered part of the mitigation and $30,000 compensation is not a mitigation factor either. I agree with that. And I, I almost feel like we ought to be doing something like the Batasso schedule of, you know, we can't take seven days a week destruction of the visitor experience. You've got to give us at least two or three days of quiet every week. Yeah, and and I hear you, Karen, unfortunately, and you know, fortunately and unfortunately, we have these amazing lands and trails surrounding us, but many, if well, actually most of them are within county jurisdiction and not city jurisdiction. And right. so we are subject to their land use code and their interpretation and development approvals thereof. And so we get to, again, act as a, as a referral agency and, and attempt to influence that, their decisions, but we also don't get to put very many conditions and requirements on those decisions. But we can opine that the proposed mitigation isn't satisfactory. And and hopefully, and to the extent I've provided those to you, hopefully our our comments have have uh, done so as far as um, clear, you know, uh, uh, conveying the impacts on the user experience out there. I just think, uh, Bethany, I, I think your attendance is, is very valuable and, and worthwhile, but I think given the commission, county commissioners are the hearing entity, um, it, it is very worthwhile having the director of the open space department uh, speaking to the commissioners. That would be and good. And I again would say individual I'm board I'm members. writing notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, th well, thank you. This is really helpful. Uh, and Karen, thank you for bringing it up. Um, we're going to adjourn yeah, by the other issue. The other issue that just gnaws at me that I'm not going to bring up for the record is is more development in the South Boulder Creek floodplain. While we're trying to come to gri grips with what to do with the floodplain where there's been development and we're not supposed to be flooding them. And now we've got more property down at 51st in Arapaho oh. where, you know, we're losing more floodplain. It's crazy. Any <laughs> other comments before we adjourn? <laughs> it is crazy. <laughs> I third the crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a pretty strange proposal. Uh, well, okay, folks. Uh, thanks then to everybody. Uh, Dan, do you have any last word? Or are we good? No, we'll see you uh, on the twenty eighth. Okay. Thank you, everybody. We are adjourned. Thanks, thanks. everyone. Yeah, thank you. Good night. And good night, Hal. Back on the East Coast. Yeah. Safe travels, Hal. Or good morning. Yeah. <laughs>